We'll have uh, two proclamations tonight, and we'll start with uh, Juneteenth. So, Sonia, if you'll come forward and bring whoever you like, please. Oh, okay. Good to hear this. Richard and and uh, this. Just one moment, but uh, I think for all of us who are behind you here, uh, we applaud what you do every year to bring this to the city, a, uh, something of real importance, not only to the city of Manhattan, but to our nation, something that needs to be recognized over and over, and you've just done a marvelous job at the celebration that you put on, so we appreciate that very much. Thank you. So Gary, if you can. Sure. This voice may not be able to. Bear with me. Okay. Here we go. Whereas President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, declaring the slaves in Confederate territory free, paving the way for the passing of the 13th Amendment, which formally abolished slavery in the United States of America. Word about the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was delayed some two and a half years to June 19, 1865, in reaching authorities and African Americans in the South and Southwestern United States. Whereas June 19 has a special meaning to African Americans and is called Juneteenth, combining the words June and 19th, and has been celebrated by the African American community for over 150 years. The annual Juneteenth celebration in the city of Manhattan will take place at City Park on Saturday, June 15, 2019. Whereas the theme of this year's Manhattan Juneteenth celebration is 30 years of education and celebration in honor of everyone who's worked diligently and enthusiastically and celebrated as a community. Now therefore, Michael Dodson, mayor of the city of Manhattan, Kansas proclaims June 15, 2019 is Juneteenth. Thank you. I'm really excited about this being our 30th year. And real quickly, I'm going to, all the community members were not able to make it tonight, but uh, Dave Baker, Derek Thomas, Herb Ely, Alan Nesbitt, Betty O. Jones, and her husband, Richard Jones. But I just want to just quickly just say that I'm really excited. We all are. And um, Manhattan, the Manhattan community and the businesses have really embraced us with donations and support this year. And I think that's indicative of how important this is, like we said, to Manhattan. And uh, it's, it, the events will start Saturday night. Uh, on Friday night, excuse me, with Arts in the Park. But one of the other things that I'm excited about, I'm quite sure with our 30th um, celebration and with the uh, level of uh, musicians and Grammy Award winner uh, Kurt Whalen uh, being playing Friday night, um, tourism dollars will be coming into this community because we're getting feedback that um, People from Kansas City and Wichita and Topeka all over will be coming in for our event. So it'll be an exciting time for Manhattan. And I want to thank you all for allowing us to continue in the support. look around the city and see all the great things that some of these groups do, uh, you, you can't overlook what PEO does. Probably one of the finest service organizations that you can find. Uh, one that's particularly dear to me is uh, this organization 
collects cookies and candy and things like that and provides them to our soldiers who are getting ready to deploy. And I can tell you as one who's deployed a few times, having a touch of home like that is very, very important and we appreciate all of the things that you do, not only for those soldiers, but for uh, all of the things that you do across this community. When uh, I was about uh, seven or eight years old, I can remember that uh, my mother would go to PEO. I can't remember what night it was, but my dad kept trying to figure out what PEO stood for. <laughs> and uh, he told us, my brother and I, that it stood for Pa Eats Out. So, <laughs> but it's still a mystery. <laughs> so Gary, can you publish the proclamation? Whereas PEO is Philanthropic Educational Organization, where women celebrate the advancement of women, cultivate women through scholarships, grants, awards, loans, and stewardship of Cotty College, and motivate women to achieve their highest aspirations. 150 years later, there are nearly 230 sisters across the United States and Canada, including eight local chapter groups in Manhattan. Whereas 8.5 million has been awarded since 2009 to provide scholarships for exceptional young women just graduating from high school. Whereas Cotty College, a nationally ranked independent liberal arts sciences college for women owned and supported by PEO offers degrees in a variety of majors. Over 102,000 women have received over 300 million through the programs, and it is one of the few women's organizations that has continued for 150 years with the same purpose and name. Now therefore, Michael Dodson, Mayor of the City of Manhattan, Kansas, calls upon all citizens of Manhattan to recognize and celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Philanthropic Educational Organization. Mayor Dodson and commissioners, thank you for helping us celebrate this 150 years. To break it down, to break what they said down, locally to the Manhattan level, we have a local, eight local chapters who have a total of 450 members right here in town, making PEO easily the largest organization in Manhattan. As the proclamation explained, the main thrust of our organization is the promotion of educational opportunities for women. And we're especially proud that this year, four of the 2019 graduates of Manhattan High were selected to receive a highly competitive national PEO scholarship. $2,500 each. Once again, we appreciate your recognition of PEO, a 150-year-old organization which remains vibrant and relevant today. Thank you. We'll now move to item number three, which is public comment. At this time, anyone wishing to make a, a comment on anything that's not on any of the uh, consent or the general agenda, please come forward and like to hear from you. And if you would, please state your name, and I think there's a there is. place for you to sign there. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Jonathan Cole. I reside at 822 Fremont. Um, I just want to start out today uh, by thanking you all for uh, being here. I know this isn't an easy job, um, but it can make a real difference in people's lives. Uh, I know you've heard you. I know you have heard me speak about um, safe housing in Manhattan several times already. 
Um, I am certain that you're aware only 32% of residents in Manhattan feel that rental housing is of um, a satisfactory state. Um, I have heard the stories of renters across town living in subpar housing. It breaks my heart to hear these atrocities that others are living in. That is why I earnestly believe we need to enforce our building code through a rental inspection policy. I have done some research into what some other communities have done um, with this like affordability and safety issue. I came across a WNDU article in South Bend, uh, Indiana, um, and how they face this same issue. Uh, Notre Dame clinical professor at law, Judith Fox, had made the following remarks on why it's essential we pass this routine inspection policy. A tenant complained repeatedly that their code, uh, and then they called their code enforcement, and code enforcement, because they were children, there were children in the house, was obligated to call ch Child Protective Services. Essentially, they were told that they had to get out or lose their children. And so nothing happened to the landlord. And what that happens is, once somebody is evicted, then it's on their record and they can't get to another place except with another bad landlord. And you know we have to, uh, we, we've got other conditions, um, problems, and that they also get evicted again. Uh, or they move out because of the conditions, so we end up with this cycle of substandard housing policy or living. Imagine being a mother in this situation with children that you can no longer take care of because Child Protective Services has come in because you called code services on your unsafe uh, living situation. This isn't an issue just facing students, it's also an issue facing families here in Manhattan. Low income families should not have to live in unsafe housing in fear of calling code inspections simply because they cannot afford better housing. Dismissing these concerns as saying that we need to have courage is not the answer. My ask of you is will you amend the current rental registration ordinance to include routine inspections and ensure safe housing for all of our families here in Manhattan? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Anyone else, please? Michael Lambert, I'm the current chair of the Flint Hills Human Rights Project and a lot of our members rent in town and have concern about rental inspections and the need for a rental inspection property. But for my own part speaking uh, here tonight, I think speaking as a homeowner who lives in East Manhattan where there's a lot of rental property, I can speak expertly on uh, the condition of rental units in my neighborhood that uh, continue to deteriorate, and I hate to think of what the inside conditions are like, although I do speak to some of my renter neighbors from time to time about that. I think this city would benefit greatly from a rental inspection policy. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, please? My name is Tom Kerrigan, uh, 705 Tuttle, I own. I'm a veteran, and uh, I know some of you here are as well. And uh, we don't want Manhattan to uh, be another Junction City. I think we could do better. And so a lot of veterans are now getting out with the uh, wars winding down, and we want to keep them coming here. So I think that it would behoove us to uh, try to look at this program a little bit harder and maybe see what we can do to make sure that those people that come here know that they're getting the best place possible for their money. Because we do have some issues here that I think we can do better at. And uh, everybody likes to give lip service to veterans. You guys are in a position to actually do something about it. And so that's just what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, please? <coughs> All right, seeing no one, we'll move to uh, item four, which is commissioner comments. And we ask at this time, any comments by commissioners? 
Um, I would just uh, say that um, the flood is having an Im the f flood threat is having an impact on people. I live east of Casement Road, and I would just say that our neighborhood and uh, the folks that live there are nervous, and it's a rather unsettling <coughs> to go from day to day with uh, that threat. And so I, you know, I think nerves are thin in some parts of town, and I would just encourage everyone to have some patience with each other as we await the uh, resolution of uh, what Tuttle Creek's gonna, what we're gonna have happen at Tuttle Creek, and hopefully nothing, but thanks. Yeah, so a couple things. First, I just wanna remind everybody that uh, June is LGBT Pride Month. Um, it was created in uh, remembrance and part of the Stonewall Riots in 1969, which was not that long ago. Um, and I just want to remind everybody, we lived in a world 50 years ago that I probably wouldn't be setting at this dais right now. Uh, so it's important for us to reflect on our history. Um, and the same thing Juneteenth makes us do, um, reflect on our history and reckon with our past um, and force us to self-reflect on how we can do better in the future. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Uh, the second thing I just want to um, comment that I appreciate the public comment and the speakers. I um, uh, thank you for being here. Continue to push on this issue. Uh, I have a fear that the commission is going to wiggle their way out of um, having an upvote down, uh, up or down vote on a rental inspection through our legislative process, and I think that would be really disappointing because it makes it harder for you to hold those elected officials accountable. Uh, but just pay attention. Uh, cost is always big concerns, but um, I think it is a platitude to say that a, a project like that would cost too much as we pass about $50, $50 million worth of other projects in our community. Um, so continue to push on the issue, and I appreciate the work that you've done. Yeah, I'll just make one comment. For, for anyone living in what has been billed as a substandard housing, I would recommend you call, you know, Brad Clausen, the code office, and let us do an inspection, because we have an inspection program. Just call, and it'll be taken care of. And if there's any issues with landlords because of that, you know, the city does also provide money to Kansas Legal Services, which does a great job at defending landlords. So, so I think there's a system in place you can achieve everything that people wish to achieve without going to greater expense. And I've worked close with the code office, and I think those guys do an outstanding job. Okay, this being uh, June 4th, this is the 100th anniversary for the, uh, when the U.S. Congress passed the 19th Amendment. It gave the U.S. woman, uh, granted the right to vote. So it seems uh, June is a very important month for a variety of uh, marginalized <coughs> groups for a while. So 100 years, um, we're thankful that we have the right to vote, and it's extremely important that everybody does vote. Uh, I'm glad we have eight candidates for the city commission, and hopefully everybody gets informed on who their representation is going to be for the city of Manhattan. Uh, we make a lot of decisions, and some might make you happy, and some might not make you happy, but you also are voting on judgment not just on having them vote the way you want them to vote. So please be informed. Thank you. Just uh, on the flood issue, I think a lot of us had an opportunity to go up and visit the emergency operations center that was set up in the uh, large hall in the fire department. Um, they had been operating for some time uh, when I got up there, but uh, Having seen many military operations, I think everybody would have been proud at how this thing was done. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I saw was the representation from around the community and outside of our community and the cooperation that uh, happened up there. Um, I think it's necessary to think about these uh, emergency operations centers in the context of how much space is required, the wiring that's required, the power that's required to go in there and then how the public is served. So if you went around that room, you saw uh, Pat Collins and his organization, you saw the RCPD, the fire department, the public affairs offices, and the public affairs was represented from just about every organization inside the uh, city of Manhattan and around the counties. So uh, the exchange of information during times like this is really important. Uh, people get very, very anxious, as Linda said, and uh, one of the things that can calm some of that anxiety is knowing some of the facts. 
And it's also, I think, comforting to know that we've got people up there who are watching all of the uh, rise and fall of the inflow and the outflow and calculating downstream damage and kind of trying to look at the whole thing in its entirety to include what it does to our downstream neighbors. You've seen the pictures of what's happening in Missouri and Arkansas as a result of the flooding. Um, the choice comes down to protecting the structures, which if you have a, a uncontrolled <coughs> release, then you've got uh, really some catastrophic outcomes that can occur. So as has been said, we're not out of the woods yet because big rains still come. We're making an impact on drawing the lake level down and the intent is to get it down to about 1128, which I think is about eight feet below the top of that dam and uh, give us a little bit of leeway for uh, flood events that we really can't calculate. When the rain comes in Nebraska and northern Kansas and gets into our watershed, it just comes into Tuttle Creek Lake, so uh, then we have to deal with it. So we need this margin of safety to uh, to hold us because it's going to we're going to continue to get rain events. And I, I think uh, Ron has some things that uh, he can report on that have been a result of the last several days of effort. But again, uh, what we hope to do is get a little bit of publicity to recognize all those that were working at the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, we went on 24-hour 24 24 day operations for several days and uh, people pitched in. The Red Cross brought food up there as well as others. and. Uh, so they were pretty well taken care of, but that's still stressful duty for all of them. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you mentioned some of the elevations we're at and what the, the goal is. We're at about 1133.66 uh, uh, this afternoon uh, for the elevation of the lake, and that's uh, gradually being drawn down. Their, their core anticipates keeping their 30,000 CFS release uh, uh, at least through the end of the week, and that should uh, continue to help draw that, that elevation down. Uh, one of the things that uh, that high release will continue to put us in a, in a risk mode is the, that puts water up against the gates that we have on the levee. So even though normally the Kansas River is, is low and below it, uh, right there where the Blue River goes into the Kansas, that backs the Kansas up. So all that water is pushing against our flood control gates. So they're closed and that makes us vulnerable for a high rain event uh, inside, the, inside the, the, the town. So that's protected by the levee. So we have several pumping stations set up to uh, help alleviate that. And so I just want to make sure you're uh, aware of that particular situation. The mayor mentioned uh, uh, the public information group that was there and I just wanted to share some stats with the with the commissioners uh, about the the group that was there we had uh, uh, not only public information officers from the city of Manhattan but uh, uh, the police department for both uh, K-State and RCPD uh, Fort Riley uh, via Christie Hospital the school district, USD 383 and USD 475, Riley County, there was just a, a, a great group of folks that uh, did a tremendous job of staffing those uh, telephones, the hotlines, which provided uh, uh, valuable information for folks. Uh, again, that was on a 24-7 ba basis. Uh, they did a, a number of things. The, the, the Twitter, Facebook, and, and website views for information were staggering just as an example uh, they did about 90 posts on Facebook on different uh, live updates and recorded updates that uh, uh, had an average that was seen by uh, almost 30,000 people uh, the highest rated post was uh, when Pat Collins uh, uh, emergency manager for Riley County was explaining the evacuation advisory and that was uh, seen by 137,141 people uh, we typically have about 50 to 60,000 unique page views on our website. That's where we had a lot of tried to keep and direct people to. Uh, during some of the highest peaks, we had uh, over 200,000 page views. So uh, one of the things that was, uh, uh, I was uh, in a lesser role in 93 when the flood happened. And so one of the things that's a huge difference between now and then is just technology and communications. You know. Uh, uh, I think at that time we were still using bag phones uh, for cell phones. Uh, so technology has certainly made it easier to communicate with folks. Uh, 
uh, and get that word out. And so that was huge. Uh, but the 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 level of cooperation uh, among the intergovernmental groups, the the private sector, uh, the nonprofit sector was just uh, phenomenal. And my hats off to all those that were involved. And don't let your guard down. Uh, it, we won't uh, be a lot comfortable. You know, it's taken it about. It's it's usually been filling up about a day faster than it goes three days to go down. So there's a lot. Uh, we're still in June, and we're gonna uh, leave uh, a lot of the stuff up in the that temporary EOC to. Hopefully, we won't have to reuse it. But uh, there's a lot of good information. I appreciate the support. Thanks. All right, we'll move to uh, item five, which is the consent agenda. And these are items that uh, have either been previously considered by the commission or are uh, regarded as housekeeping in nature. And um, if anyone would like to come forward and, and uh, comment on any agenda item that's under the consent agenda, you may do so at this time, and then we'll have commissioner comments. All right, seeing no one, uh, any comments on the consent agenda? Seeing, seeing none, we'll entertain a motion. Uh, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Please call the roll. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner McKee. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. We'll now move to item six, which is the general agenda. And item A under the general agenda is to consider the first reading of an ordinance amending ordinance number 7104 and 7143 of the Abbott's Landing Commercial Planned Unit Development to allow for construction of a scooter's coffee drive through kiosk on lot four of Abbott's Landing. And the presenter will be Chad Bunker. Thank you, Mayor. Again, my name is Chad Bunger. I'm the uh, Assistant Director for Community Development and uh, happy to present this item. Um, <clears throat> the, that seemed like it jumped off the quick. Uh, the proposal for tonight is a, uh, an amendment to the Abbott's Landing PUD, as you mentioned, for the small coffee kiosk um, at the corner of Alvin's Place, McCall Road. Uh, for reference, uh, Arby's, uh, restaurant would be here and then the rest of uh, the businesses in front of Menards would be to your east. Um, originally this was proposed as a drive-through ATM. Um, the, the business, the, the coffee drive-through business is, has proposed to uh, take its place. Um, it's a fairly small site, fairly simple in, in regards to what is proposed. Uh, a little under 600 square foot building be primarily for uh, drive through businesses. I do not think they'll have any sit down space, obviously, is it because of its size. The traffic flow um, will come through either Hummel's place to the north or Alvin's, enter the site, um, order, pick up its coffee, and exit. There are three parking spaces for employees, um, and then there is a uh, a shared cross easement through that whole development for access uh, so they'll be sharing and driving aisles with Arby's. This is a second round of uh, site plan uh, at the public hearing. The first public hearing with the planning board, the, a different site uh, was proposed that the neighboring properties were not fans of, so the planning board tabled it, brought this back, and to my knowledge there was no uh, issues with this site plan. So. Here's the, the facade views of the building. Um, again, nothing too uh, extensive because of its size and its use, but it is there. Um, and as I mentioned, the planning board saw this a few weeks ago and uh, recommended approval of the amendment to the existing PUD ordinance for Abbott's Landing and then amending the uh, or approving the final development plan for the site. Uh, and uh, city administration is also recommending approval. So I don't know if you have any uh, questions that I may answer for you. I just had one quick question. Yes, sir. And I'm sorry if I'm just looking at this the wrong way, but on 
this graphic right here, the mm -hmm. up and the down arrows. And when you look at the gra graphic that's in the packet, that's gonna border the parking lot. Is that a new road or is it just like a, what is, what is this? What is there, you bet. Um, so right now this is, the site is uh, a grass space, open mm -hmm. space. Uh, this area here, the, the light area with the arrows pointing down is the edge of Arby's is parking lot. It's basically one lane, uh, access lane for, for these stalls here. And they'll add on to it, basically a join right to that parking lot and add this uh, second width of a driving aisle for so that parking lot. So will there be like a curb there or is it just going to be paved? It'll be free flowing back and forth, uh, just a budding equal pavement. And Arby's, they didn't comment on this one? They don't have a concern with that? They did not have a concern. They do share um, a cross easement so that I believe with the exception of maybe changing up parking spaces or islands or stuff, they have to allow that free flow of access back and forth is my okay. understanding. Thank you. Yep. Chad, I do have a question with regard if you would show us just with your mm -hmm. indicator where the traffic comes in and where it will exit so and then it, onto the street. Sure. Um, this, and I'll maybe pull up a Google map. I thought I had a... Uh, <coughs> aerial display but it didn't work um, there are multiple uh, ways to get into the site bear with me please I apologize let's try it this way um, if you can see this I apologize for the coloring um, so McCall's here to the south and then there's uh, Alvin's place and Hummel's place there's multiple ways you can enter you could come through um, off of Hayes and you know from the west down into the site or from Alvin's. Primarily the exit points will be either back circling back through to Alvin and on the McCall or back to Hayes or what it, there's two additional curb cuts on the McCall but there will not be a direct um, access point from this site on the McCall. You'll have to either circle through the, the existing road network or the so parking lot network. So there will be no access point onto McCall Correct. from this site. Correct. Okay. Because I thought I read about a a right out, uh, but that's not going to... Originally, or at one point, they had proposed a... Um, the site was redrawn okay. and the building was relocated and that's there was going to be a right out on the Alvin's place, but okay. because of its proximity and um, some concerns of other issues with the site layout, that the neighbors weren't fans of, they redesigned it to this. Uh, and so there's really no direct access to McCall or even Alvin's place, which okay. is to the immediate east. Because I had a concern about the right outs on mm -hmm. McCall Road, and I didn't want to create another one nope. that doesn't work. So, okay, thank yep. you. Is that it for me? Great, thank you. Again, uh, any comment from the public on this particular item? Okay, Searing none, we'll come back to the commission and if there's no further comment, we'll entertain a uh, motion. Mayor, I'm uh, excited to have a coffee location on McCall Road. I miss the old one that was there and so it's encouraging that another one is coming. I hope that um, there's enough room for the stacking. We have had some issues with stack cars uh, in line at some of the coffee shops in town. So I don't want to set up a new uh, issue for people on McCall Road that haven't had that. Don't, we don't have that issue now. But um, uh, so I am supportive of this and I would make a motion that, if I find it, just a second. <laughs> Um, I move that we approve the first reading of an ordinance amending ordinance numbers <coughs> 7104 and 7143 for the Abbott's Landing commercial planned unit development with respect to lot 4, Abbott's Landing, a 14,875 square foot lot located at the northwest corner of Alvin's Place and McCall Road for the Scooters Coffee drive through kiosk based on the findings in the staff report and the recommendation of the Manhattan Urban Area Planning Board. Second. 
I would also just say that I, when this, when I first started hearing about scooters, I had never heard of it before. But our Chamber of Commerce organized a, a, a trip for a busload of people to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. And there were scooters all over Lincoln, so it, uh, it it's a tried and true, and there are different uh, models there even. Some are sit down, some are drive up only, so it was really informative to actually uh, be on the bus and see all those locations. Okay. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner McKee. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Now move to item B, which is to consider the first reading of an ordinance regarding large vehicle parking on public streets in residential areas. And the presenter is Dennis Marshall, Assistant City Manager. Good evening, Mayor Dodson, Mayor Pro Tem Reddy, and Commissioners. Tonight I come to you to talk about an ordinance we have on your agenda to talk about large vehicle parking in residential areas. So one of the, the four points that we want to cover with you tonight about the discussion issues is really what is the need for an ordinance in relation to some of the other parking ordinances that we currently have on the books. Talk about the definition of how we are looking at large vehicles and really realizing we're really just talking about overnight parking situation for large vehicles then also having the opportunity for some exceptions through temporary permits. And so as we begin the conversation, I want to keep in mind that really we have done a lot of work in different parking ordinances to really address or accommodate different parking needs in our community. So this is just a continuation of a lot of the efforts that you've already put in around parking ordinances in our community. Some of the existing ones that we have is the no unattended vehicles for more than 48 hours. We also have different parking laws governing some of our parking lots about people cannot cross park across multiple parking stalls. We also have different rules in place for landscape trailers when they're doing work in commerce across the community. Also, if you see construction trailers, dumpsters, different construction related item in the public right of way, we also have different ordinances and rules governing those, as well as one of the pictures you see here about even addressing the non-motorized vehicles or again trailers in our community. So this is again is just an additional need that we've identified for non-motorized non -motorized and motorized vehicles. So what is the need or why are we before you tonight? A lot of concern has been raised through some complaint based other issues that we've seen around residential areas where we have both uh, vehicular pedestrian and bicycle safety issues particularly in those residential areas without sidewalks or without streetlights. And so one of the concerns is what is the ability for emergency response vehicles to pass through on some of our residential roads when you might have a large vehicle or you have a large vehicle and directly across from it is another large truck or another vehicle. Also, some of our other ordinances talk about public appearance and quality of life. What do these vehicles do in our neighborhoods when we talk about quality of life issues? But also, when we talk about promoting commerce, when we do have these landscape trailers, other commerce vehicles trying to get through residential space, trying to do some of their business during the day, some of them may be impeded by these large vehicles, such as RVs, which we'll talk about here. As we propose in the ordinance, we are describing or categorizing a large vehicle as any oversized motor vehicle or a combination of a motor vehicle and a, with a trailer that may be um, attached to it that exceeds 22 feet in length. We're also talking about 8 feet in width, 8 feet in height, and that also takes into uh, exclusive of the lights or factory installed mirrors and it does not apply to any government emergency vehicles. So this is work on basically the private vehicles in residential areas and there's a couple different descriptions. Maybe the large bus, even a trolley, some of the longer vans. We're talking anything that exceeds 22 feet in length and that can also be with an attached trailer. Our focus today is really addressing them at the nighttime hours in residential neighborhoods. So not really during the daytime hours, but what the ordinance that we have in front of you talks about is making it unlawful to park on any public street, highway or alley within any residential district during the nighttime hours. And nighttime hours are stipulated between one half hour after sunset until one half hour before the next day's sunrise. And so one thing to keep in mind while we're talking about the public right away in public streets, 
We also want to make sure, make sure that we recognize there are HOAs and other covenants in certain neighborhoods that may already have this restriction in place or even more restrictive measures. For instance, some HOAs, whether in Manhattan or across the country, don't even allow boats, RVs, or other things to be parked within the neighborhood, whether it's on driveways for private street or private driveways or not. So we do have to keep in mind that there are some maybe further restrictions or covenants that exist in some of our neighborhoods right now. What we're talking about is for our public streets and right-of-ways. And so, for instance, a picture in the uh, screen right there, that would be an appropriate place unless your HOA or neighborhood has a covenant. But to have a large vehicle parked on a private residential drive is appropriate any time during the day, day or night. Does it need to be behind a certain sidewalk yes absolutely it, has to be like it just has to be behind the sidewalk it doesn't have to correct. be behind the front of the house no correct it has to just the, si okay. address the sidewalk thank you i appreciate knowing um, that but we do also want to be accommodating because we understand visitors there's other needs that people have for their large vehicles to be parked on a residential street and so we do want to offer the opportunity to have some ability to do this during certain and limited occasions and so that would be a permit that can be achieved through the city for a temporary period of time. It can be usually during the day, even at nighttime, to actively load or unload passengers or merchandise or materials. Um, if the driver is available to move the vehicle, that's part of our concern is if there's emergency vehicles trying to get through, you always want someone there. But if there is some request for an overnight need or parking, we would offer or encourage you to consider the ordinance that would allow neighbors or residents to obtain a period or a permit to twi uh, park twice within a 12-month period. So they can leave their large 22-foot vehicle on the street overnight at least twice within a 12-month period within their neighborhood. But when they're doing that and that twice during the 12-month period, they cannot exceed five consecutive days for each of those two times. And then we would just ask that there be a $5 per day fee for the number of days up to five that they would like to obtain a permit for this temporary parking. As of now, if you go through the variety of different parking ordinances and fines in the city code, there are fines in there anywhere from basically $25 to $50. The recommendation in the ordinance right now is a $25 fee should they be ticketed and convicted of leaving their large vehicle parked on the residential street overnight. And so we have consulted with RCPD. They have reviewed this information. They're in support of the information and are willing to enforce whatever parameters and assess whatever fines that you want to levy with this ordinance. And so it's kind of straightforward as uh, we just ran through it to address really the safety issues, but our residential neighborhoods really want a little bit of relief from these large vehicles occupying the streets in their neighborhood. And this would be on a complaint basis? Generally, yeah, most of our parking most issues. Would be. Um, certainly, if RCPD is out patrolling neighborhoods right. and they notice that, they're certainly aware of or would be aware of the law and can certainly ticket. But a lot of times, it's very frequent that we get complaint basis for many of our even speeding and traffic issues that RCPD enforces. What I've noticed is that it's up to a citizen to report <coughs> to the police. Uh, at least that's how it's worked in my neighborhood. And upon calling the police, then the police uh, begin their clock mm -hmm. of number of days, that kind of thing, so that they're watching pretty consistently. And that's a good example, particularly with our 48 hour rule, because yeah. that generally is complaint based. Mm -hmm. And so police aren't always out there and know if it's been 24 hours or 48 hours, and so they will yeah. do the marking and start the well, clock. Well, I don't think we'll be, we'll be treating the owners of these vehicles any different than the other people who park over 48 hours in, uh, in a, in, in, on, our on the street in front of somebody else's house or even their own. Uh, it, 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 it's a way for us because evidently we have not been able to make citations for these large vehicles and now we're just including them in with other vehicles with regard to the, their presence on the street for long periods of time. So that what I've noticed is that some of these vehicles are being stored on the streets 
and want a commercial vehicle rather than perhaps paying to store it somewhere, not having some place. It's a business, and it's part of the business is to uh, uh, not plant, not park the vehicle down around City Park or in City Park for two months at a time. Uh, we don't provide free parking for that. So anyway, I, uh, sounds like a reasonable proposal. Um, I very well could have missed it. It might have been an actual taxi or ordinance, excuse me. I didn't see um, any the actual process of the approval of the permit. I mean, this came up really two situations, correct me if I'm wrong, parking in places like City Park and then also parking on the street. And I was wondering if the approval process is going to be any more difficult for someone who would park their RV in City Park parking lot versus on a residential street. I, I think one of those scenarios the Commission likes better than the other, so I was just curious if any assumptions about that are built out in the permit process. Well, I want to be very clear that this ordinance does not address parking in City Park. Oh, so that even that's, though that's a public... Right. As I said, this is an evolutionary process where you've taken parking and dealt with landscape trailers and other things. Now we're talking about the large vehicles. Parking okay. in City Park will be okay, coming that, at you down the road. That makes sense. So, okay, yeah. thank you. So, and, but to get to your point, actually, we did not outline what is the permitting process or how you're able to obtain a permit. Um, it would be through the City Manager's Customer Service Office where they come down, pay the fine, do the paperwork, and get the permit in hand. Okay. And so it's very simple and straightforward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a few questions. So as I was looking through some of these things, I understand the reason for why we're doing it, because there have been some um, complaints about the party bus and other vehicles being parked here and there and kind of being a nuisance um, in those areas, in the residential areas. So. As I look at this, it says, uh, I, I would like to modify it. I'm not against it, but I would like to modify it. It just says it gives a two-day limit uh, for part. I think that's kind of too, too little, um, two days, uh, where you can only get it for two days. Is that right, or two permits? Two permits in the 12-month period, but the permits can be for up to five days per the two times, so 10 days. Right, so then some of the other areas, they were giving um, several more than just the two. So I don't know why we limited, was there a problem or why did we pick two? Two seems to be sufficient for the number of people have visitors in town or whatever it may be. Right. Clearly, it's at your discretion. Can we that, just say each time they want to do it, you can get it for a five-day period, but they have to pay for each of those days mm -hmm. and five-day intervals. Um, because you don't know the if we have, for example, if there's football games and maybe that's why people come, or if there's other reasons for why people come in uh, in a larger vehicle. So I would like to leave room for more than just the two. I don't know what limit I would like, but I think two is too small. I, I'm not sure there even needs to be much of a limit if they have to pay for each of those things each time they're here. My other point is to the paying of the $5. So how does one go about doing that? I mean, how do you get people to know that? Because right now they're not accustomed to knowing, like, I have a neighbor, I have several neighbors that have large vehicles in front of them. I don't think twice about it. I mean, they're very neighborly, very friendly. We all get along just fine, and it's never been an eyesore for me to see something like that mm -hmm. because it's just what's there. And being also in an agricultural community, you see a lot of large vehicles uh, on, on side streets where they're not uh, blocking any view um, or pedestrians or anything of that sort so how do we I would hate for them to pay five dollars each time or for each day for those things is that the normal fee or uh, are there other uh, cities in the state of Kansas that are charging five dollars per day a couple of things so the five dollar per day is just for the permit period and as of so now, it's not for a day, it's for the permit it, period. But now we're saying the permit period would be five days, twice in a 12 month period. Okay. So it'd only be $25 max or $50 max for the two periods as it currently stands. If we wanna extend the two day or two opportunities in a 12 month to five or whatever, but the $5 per day is just for the number of days they would like to have that permit. So you could do two days in the fall, that'd be $10, 
and then two days in the spring with a visitor here, that'd be another ten dollars for a total of twenty dollars. Right. What I was thinking, what I was visualizing is having it for a set number of days that they can get it and maybe have, they can do this um, seven to ten times a year, but giving that fee as a nominal, very, very small amount because we have a lot of people in our community that use large vehicles all the time and they're, uh, they're doing it the right way. They're not doing it uh, to encringe or encroach on anybody's territory or to be a hazard or an eyesore to anybody either. They have good intentions, but I just want to make sure uh, we address that uh, in some format. I think the other things are all right, um, according to what we have uh, and the other definitions you gave. Is there another community in the state of Kansas that's doing this? Obviously, the state is not doing anything, right? So. The general statute on road ordinances or street ordinances for the state of Kansas is not specific to parking and residential or overnight. large vehicle or parking. So, yeah. So the state, you're right, is silent on that. Um, but yeah, there's a number of communities. We can look across for Kansas, but across the country. Um, Most of them ban it actually altogether. <coughs> there was one other city in Kansas that did a permit. Okay. Most of them, Most of them ban vehicle, large vehicle parking in residential districts in Kansas. Okay, in Kansas they banned. We had one, I think okay. one community that did a permit, which we felt was the a balance that we were seeking, but most just ban it. Okay, because I didn't see anything, so I wasn't sure. But when I looked at it and looked at other cities in other states, they all had something closer right. to what we have. Right. They didn't ban it, and maybe that's something I just selectively overlooked or something, I don't know. But uh, I think this is something we can work with. Uh, you know, maybe giving them more options for parking in certain areas. No, we, did, time. we did want to be accommodating to allow the permit option. Right. Okay, I, I don't have a problem with it. I think what drove this was uh, people were complaining there were RVs in the residential areas. It was hazardous because somebody's going to run over some kid playing that was going to run behind it. And so the goal here is basically to get the things off the street. I mean, that's the idea behind it. Now, if somebody comes to visit you with an RV, I've got a cousin does it every once in a while. Nothing stops them from parking it in my driveway. I've got two car wide driveways. They can park it there and I can put my car in the street. Doesn't violate anything. They don't need a permit. So, that, so there's ways that people can get around this, but this is really designed for, you know, safety reasons and to make that, you know, not happen. Now, my only concern is I think maybe a $25 fine, not enough. Because what does it cost to store one? I don't know. I, I didn't investigate that, but it might be cheaper to pay the fine. Than, than pay for a place to park it. And so, you know, I've always thought our parking fines are too low anyway because they're not comparable to what K-State has. And if you want to change behavior, you, you got to make it more painful. So my only concern would be I would raise the fine. I, and I understand about parking it in, uh, in your driveway. There are a lot of people that don't have driveways, driveways or the ones that do and have a garage. Some of them use that for, I have a neighbor that stores stuff in their garage and parks on their driveway and has a large vehicle outside by the curb. So they use it for a variety of reasons. So I'm just, I'm not against what you're saying, but I think uh, there are reasons why people have it on their, not on their driveway. Um, so. Okay, any uh, public comment on this issue? Right, seeing none, and back to the commission for any, any further comment. The the only thing I, that I would add probably is that um, one of the rationale for having a set number that you can apply for is so you just don't do back to back to back to back and be willing to pay five dollars a day for it. So, <clears throat> any yeah, the only one other thing I would add is when uh, the like areas that I have seen before. Some streets with the different varying widths of streets in Manhattan, I, it, it, it's, think about an RV parked on like Vatier or Thurston or Raton, one of those streets, like it's hard enough to get through those streets as it is, let alone if an RV is parked on it. Um, so I, I feel like we all, it, like this is a necessary step that we have to take, um, regardless if it works on a few streets. There's so many streets that it would become a hazard for that we have to move forward on something. I do think there's a safety issue in residential uh, areas, and I think we should stress that um, beyond 
just the aesthetics, uh, but certainly I'm looking forward to the uh, banning them in City Park, or at least our parks also. The county went through this a while back with semis and said you can't park in our, you know, some of our areas, and so they've de dedicated or allow semis to park out at the county shops. And, um, and that works, has worked well. They're not on our residential streets, they're not in the parks, they're not at Seco Park. So there are, uh, there is precedent here for, for this. And uh, um, with that, I would make a motion that we approve the first reading of an ordinance amending section 31-32 of the Code of Ordinances regarding parking and permitting of large vehicles on city streets. Second. I would say too that I'd be willing to as uh, to entertain at a later date the possible increase in the $25 fine. I think that's minimal, but I do want to get this underway and I want it to be something that's enforceable. So as time goes on, we may take a look at that and raise it. At least I hope so. I agree. Well, we can still come back to you in the second reading with a different dollar amount. I think Commissioner Butler made a valid point. Thank you. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner McKee. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. So we'll now move to item C. Item C is to consider the first reading of ordinances adopting the 2018 International Codes and the 2017 National Electrical Code and updates to licensing and demolition ordinances. This will be presented by Brad Clausen, Assistant Chief, Risk Reduction and Code Services. Thank you, Mayor, yeah. Commissioners. Uh, I'm going to kick this item off tonight. I'm going to actually have uh, some of my staff do the bulk of the presentation, but uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll just make a few comments up front. Um, this is an item we bring before you once about every three years. Uh, that's how often the codes are updated nationally. And this will be my 10th time going through this process. And I hope over that time, I think we've improved this process and hopefully made it as, as good as we can, as smooth as we can, uh, and refine that process uh, over, those, uh, all of, over all those years. Uh, this process, this current process, we started about this time last year with staff review of all the code changes. Um, we spend a lot of time going through all of those code books and determining what the changes are. But I will tell you that I don't think that this process would go as smoothly as it did without the assistance of a lot of groups and individuals. I'd like to recognize some of those that are here tonight. Uh, Mr. Brad Hartenstein, who's the executive officer with Flint Hills Area Builders Association. Um, Brad and his folks are excellent to work with. They help us with our continuing ed classes and so uh, appreciate all that he does. Mr. Garrick Baker. Garrick's the uh, incoming president with the uh, Flint Hills chapter of the American Institute of Architects. I had to make sure I got that right and appreciate their work as well. Representing a couple of our city boards tonight that go through this process, David Stevenson. David works with Central Mechanical Construction and he's on our Code Appeals Board. And then also Mr. Bill Muir. Bill's the chairman of our Housing Appeals Board and that's the board that hears appeals to our property maintenance code. So many thanks to those folks for being here and, and being a part of this process and spending many hours in helping us get this done. I want to uh, introduce now a couple of my staff who uh, are here tonight. Um, Deputy Fire Marshal Ryan Courtright will be doing our presentation tonight. And then also Deputy Building Official Darren Emery is here with us as well. And uh, Darren and I and Ryan will all be here for uh, questions if you should have as soon as the presentation's over. So thank you. While they're coming up, I just, uh, when we were talking about folks that went above and beyond in the flood prep stuff, I, my hat's off to the fire department personnel, both on the code side as well as the uh, responder side that did door-to-door -door notices and education efforts and gathered a lot of data that really made uh, 
uh, informing that. And then I neglected to not recognize uh, another group of uh, high performers we had were our GS folks, both yeah. from the city and from Riley County that uh, really made a, a huge difference. Not only they developed a special app for gathering data just for this event, uh, as well as uh, produced a lot of maps. So thank you guys for all you've done. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Ryan Courtright. I'm the deputy fire marshal at the fire department. Uh, this evening, I'm gonna go through a, a brief introduction for uh, you guys on uh, how the codes that we adopt here locally um, are developed, uh, and also provide you with a brief history of um, code adoption here in Manhattan over the years. Uh, also be providing you with an overview of, uh, as Brad mentioned, the staff time preparation that's gone in uh, before tonight's meeting, uh, and some of the results from our uh, stakeholder meetings that we've had. Uh, we'll also go through a review of uh, some of the most significant changes, um, highlight those uh, that are a part of the 2018 codes, uh, and then uh, at the end we'll uh, go through some proposed uh, changes to our fee structure and our uh, ordinances that govern uh, contractor licensing here in Manhattan. The International Code Council uh, is a not-for-profit uh, corporation that was established in the mid-90s uh, that develops um, model codes uh, that can be adopted uh, across the world um, uh, by municipalities, uh, state entities, uh, things of that nature. Uh, the mission of the International Code Council is to provide the highest quality code standards, products, and services for all concerned with safety and performance of the built environment. The International Code Council uh, updates their codes on a three-year cycle. Uh, this diagram gives you a depiction of, of kind of how that cycle works. Um, the, the process begins by uh, a code change uh, proposal that's submitted. Um, anybody can propose a code change uh, to the ICC. Uh, you don't have to be a, a code professional or a contractor or anything of that uh, nature. Uh, anybody can do it. Uh, with that proposal, um, you have to give a written description of essentially what you're wanting to change, uh, why you feel it needs to be changed, and then there's also a cost-benefit analysis that's submitted along with that. Uh, the code change proposal goes through various uh, hearings, uh, public hearings, uh, all the way to the point where it's uh, it's voted on at the uh, final action hearings uh, before being published. Uh, Assistant Chief Clausen and I uh, uh, had the opportunity to attend a final action hearing a couple years ago and actually vote on some of the items we're going to talk about tonight. So, a uh, brief history of the uh, code adoption here in Manhattan. Um, uh, first of all, the the first uh, building code uh, in the United States it was in 1927. Uh, National Building Code. Um, here in Manhattan, we didn't adopt our first building code until 1967, uh, when we adopted the 1967 uh, National Building Code. Uh, with one exception, um, being in 1976, we've uh, traditionally um, adopted the new additions of the codes on a three-year um, cycle. Uh, we're currently on the 2015 International Codes. Um, it's been three years, so we're here um, again to now uh, update our codes and adopt the 2018 code. Here's the all-inclusive list of the codes that we're uh, proposing uh, to update and adopt. Um, as you can see, uh, with the exception of the Natural Electric Code, all these codes are, are produced by the uh, International Code Council. As Assistant Chief Clausen mentioned, uh, staff started reviewing the uh, significant changes to the codes uh, early last year. Um, after we kind of had our brains wrapped around what those significant changes were, uh, we started meeting with stakeholder groups. Uh, we meet with these same folks each time we do our, our uh, code adoption process. Uh, the, uh, I won't go through all these groups, but uh, the uh, two that I'd probably point out, the Flint Hills Area Builders Association and the Flint Hills chapter of the AIA uh, were two groups that uh, we got a lot of uh, support from and a lot of good uh, input from. We also have two uh, boards that we uh, also meet with and, and gather input from. Uh, we had good turnouts for those meetings, uh, got a lot of good input. Uh, we had over 200, 230 uh, attendees at those meetings and over 20 hours of uh, work into those meetings. Hey, Ryan, real quick, before you move off of that slide, so besides the two organizations that sent in support letters, could you expand at all on maybe what you heard at some of the stakeholder meetings? I've met with some of those groups, too, and something I consistently hear is our codes are onerous, and that's what's making prices go up. And then I ask what codes are onerous, and I never really get a straight answer. So I was just curious, are there particular things that we receive feedback 
um, from any of these groups that this seems onerous um, consistently? I know that there's probably a bunch of one-offs, but... Um, so, I, so for example, with our licensed contractor groups, those are almost presented as a continuing education class where we go through the significant changes. Uh, certainly, there's an opportunity for comment at those. Um, I'll tell you, we don't get a whole lot of feedback from those. Um, it's more of an educational um, uh, event. Um, the Landlords of Manhattan, I actually wasn't a part of that. Uh, Assistant Chief Clausen and uh, Deputy, Fish, Deputy Building Official Emery were a part of that. Uh, I don't... Any my, significant do you feedback any? you heard from them? Any significant feedback? No, Commissioner, we really, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of anything really negative anyone had to say in particular about this particular edition, and, and I didn't, I, I certainly didn't note anything that was, um, you know, a big hot button item for anybody, it didn't seem like. In fact, um, you know, our licensed contractors, generally there are some things in the code this time, I think, that will actually, from their point of view, maybe benefit how they actually construct something or at least give them some flexibility and latitude so uh, I really can't really point out anything that we received as negative feedback from those meetings. I find meetings. that shocking but I believe okay. you so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to follow up though in the past because we've done this a few times there have been specific things we haven't improved like I recall one time to just put in perspective was it had something to do with air conditioning and some kind of a little device that big cities were making everybody put on there because people were sniffing the sea oh, out of them sure. or something. Yeah, and we did not put that in the code. Yeah, I mean, we've had things over the years that have not, that have been deleted by amendment in the code just because, you know, we received uh, some really negative feedback on some things, p potentially s somewhat like you're talking about. Uh, what we try to do with all these meetings, though, is sort of weed all that stuff out beforehand, and the purpose of going through this 21 hours plus of meetings we had was to try and resolve all those differences before we get to this point. And we spent the better part of, well, we spent two parts of two days with um, a group of, I think, five of the Flint Hills Area Builders Association board members and went over all of these changes and in the end um, we made some some modifications to the codes through amendments uh, to um, address some of their concerns and some of their comments uh, so you know our again our intent when we get to this point is that hopefully we've addressed those questions and concerns and it, it's one other thing I'd point out it's interesting that once in a while uh, our code appeals board, for instance, the last code that we adopted, they actually added an item that was more stringent than the code. They asked us to amend the code to make something more restrictive than is currently in there. They just felt that it was something that, that was important. So, you know, as, as odd as that sounds, once in a while we'll actually get feedback from, from uh, contractors that actually moves the code in a more restrictive fashion so uh, we get comments on both sides though of that issue on the national level uh, there there's widespread support for the uh, international codes uh, specifically the the uh, American Institute of Architects and the National Home Builders Association uh, all uh, garnered support for the, the international codes. Uh, there are also various uh, federal agencies that, that implement uh, the international codes through their work. In Kansas, uh, the uh, just to kind of give you a frame of reference, uh, Lenexa and Lawrence uh, have both completed the adoption process of the 2018 codes. Uh, there are other various cities that are either in process or, or plan to adopt the 18 codes here. Uh, before the end of the year. Uh, Hutchison, Shawnee, Salina, and Olathe are all in process of, of adopting it. Uh, I'd also point out that the State Fire Marshal's Office is actually uh, in the process of um, transitioning to the 2018 codes as well. So, uh, I believe you guys have uh, the letters of support uh, from both the Flint Hills Area Builders Association, the Flint Hills chapter of American Institute of Architects. Uh, again, uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from those folks and, and our stakeholder meetings with them uh, 
were a good experience and they're appreciated on both on our side of the table and uh, with them. We, uh, we met with two uh, boards uh, that we have here in Manhattan. Uh, the first, ho first board that we met with is the Housing Appeals Board. Uh, this is a five member board made up of the citizens at large that are appointed by the mayor. Uh, this board is responsible for hearing appeals uh, to the International Property Maintenance Code. Uh, so for example, um, if we do a property maintenance inspection and we find a ceiling height that's less than what's permitted by the International Property Maintenance Code, this board would, would hear that. Uh, case and, and make a decision on whether or not they would accept that ceiling height below what the code minimum is. Uh, this board, uh, when we met with them back in April, voted unanimously to recommend um, adoption of the 2008, 2018 International Property Maintenance Code. Second board uh, that we met with is the Code Appeals Board. Uh, this is a nine member board. Uh, it's made up of licensed contractors, licensed trade persons, uh, professional engineer, uh, and this board is also appointed by the mayor. Uh, this board hears issues regarding construction codes and licensing. Uh, the board is required by ordinance uh, to make a recommendation anytime uh, to the governing body anytime uh, changes or modifications are proposed to the construction codes. Uh, again, this board voted unanimously to recommend uh, adoption of the 2018 International uh, Construction Codes. So I think it's important in, that we uh, answer the question as to why we update codes and, and why it's important to update codes. Uh, the fact of the matter is the average person spends nearly 90% of their time in the built environment uh, makes it ever more important that uh, we uh, adopt a code, um, keep it up to date, uh, to ensure the, in the safety of our citizens in the buildings in our community. Uh, it's important to note too that the, the code is just a minimum. Um, things change over time. We learn from events, uh, catastrophic fires, natural disasters. Uh, so it's important to, to continually update the code so that that minimum um, stays at a threshold that uh, is able to support um, life safety uh, in our community. Uh, updating our codes ensures that new technologies, materials, and methods um, are recognized by the code. Um, the, uh, if we don't do this on a continual basis, a uh, good example I'd give, it, I think I got it later in the presentation too, is uh, uh, wireless technology for interconnection of smoke alarms. Uh, currently our code doesn't recognize that technology, um, however it is very useful. Uh, especially in an existing application where you can't run wire between detectors. Uh, the 2018 actually code actually uh, recognizes that technology. Again, that's a, a good example of why we need to up our, update our codes to recognize those, uh, those new technologies and, and means and methods. Uh, strong and update building codes are our first and best line of defense against natural disasters. Uh, and again, people are protected every day in many ways from continually updating the codes. We'll move on now to some uh, highlights, some of the more significant changes uh, in the 2018 codes. Uh, first thing we'll start off with is a prohibition for char uh, charcoal grills on combustible decks and balconies. Uh, and uh, in, in apartment settings is specifically what we're, we're talking about. Uh, kind of give you some backstory. Uh, the, two th the International Fire Code has always had a strict prohibition against grills being used on combustible decks and balconies. Uh, the first edition of the fire, International Fire Code uh, was a 2000 edition. We adopted that here in Manhattan in 2001. Uh, at that time, the governing body elected to amend that section out of the code, uh, and we've done so with every other adoption since then. So currently here in Manhattan, um, it's perfectly legal to operate a grill on a combustible deck or balcony. Uh, with some recent uh, deck fires we've had, some being uh, very large in scale and having very large um, loss values to them, we took a a look at some ways that we could mitigate some of the hazards and some of the ignition sources on these decks and balconies. Uh, and charcoal grills is, is a, what we thought was a good starting point. Um, so the, uh, the prohibition what we're talking about is specific to charcoal grills. Uh, we did uh, reach out to some of our larger complex owners here in town. Uh, we found that um, uh, many of them regulate grills on their own just through private uh, rules and regulations. We also found that some of them, some and many of them were surprised to find out that you could even have them um, in Manhattan on, on uh, decks and balconies. Uh, so uh, to clarify too, uh, uh, this prohibition would not apply to one and two family dwellings. So um, single family dwellings, townhouses, duplexes, this wouldn't apply to. This would strictly be for apartment buildings. Uh, this wouldn't apply to buildings that are, have an automatic sprinkler system when that sprinkler system provides protection to the decks and balconies. Uh, and you would still be able to use your, your standard uh, propane, residential propane grill on decks and balconies. So it still would apply if it's one of the, if it's like, a, 
I'm forgetting where one that, but I live close to one where it's an apartment building, but it's all one level and they pretty much, it's almost like a townhouse, but instead of having two, you have like five or six people living together in a smaller area, even though they're level concrete balconies, it would still, this would apply to them. Yeah. So the, that section, um, without getting too geeky with it is it's essentially, it's trying to eliminate having those, that, that, uh, that cooking appliance, uh, next to a combustible surface that that could potentially start a fire so the way the there were combustibles not in here but we're talking about wood balconies and that kind of thing okay. so concrete balconies and stuff this wouldn't apply to so thank you mm -hmm. uh, moving on to uh, some changes uh, regarding carbon monoxide alarms uh, currently carbon monoxide alarms are required in all new residential structures that either have an attached garage or contain fuel burning appliances uh, for existing buildings, uh, carbon monoxide alarms are required anytime we issue a building permit to renovate that building. Uh, the code change in the 18 basically uh, makes it a blanket statement across the board that all residential structures that have those uh, elements uh, would be required to have carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, and then finally, um, the replacement of smoke detectors every 10 years has been implemented into the uh, 2018 codes. Uh, this is actually not necessarily a new requirement. It's really just putting the code in line with industry standards and manufacturer recommendations uh, that have existed for years. Uh, this just kind of takes the guesswork out of it and actually just gives us the code text to enforce that. I'd also like to mention uh, one other significant change that didn't make it into the presentation. Uh, with the uh, ever-growing um, threat of active violence at schools, uh, the fire code now with the 2018 edition is, is recognizing uh, and regulating uh, lockdown drills and procedures to be used. Uh, it all, also recognizes different locking mechanisms for classroom doors and things like that. Uh, there's a, a potential, there is a real conflict in between locking down a building versus the fire code's approach to obtaining free egress and in, in, in the event of a fire. Uh, I think it's, uh, that section of the code will continue to evolve over the, the next code cycles and, on, and moving forward. Uh, but it is nice to know that, that that stuff is getting into the code. We have a way of, of um, at least managing um, lockdown drills, and also there's some options out there now uh, for some different locking devices for doors and schools. Final uh, significant change that I'd like to go over is probably the one that, um, in my opinion, is probably the most significant. Um, Generally speaking, our codes are not retroactive in nature. Uh, it's very rare uh, that you'll get a retroactive requirement that uh, tells you you have to take an existing building and make an improvement. Um, there, uh, it does happen. Um, the code that we have adopted now actually has a retroactive requirement for fire sprinkler systems to be installed in high-rise buildings. Uh, here in Manhattan, we only have one of those. That's the building across from the post office. Uh, so that building, uh, they have a 10-year plan and a 10-year period to get that system installed. Uh, and they have started that process of, of uh, at least getting the design work and, and starting to uh, try to raise the funds to do so. Uh, similarly, uh, the 2018 code um, has a retroactive requirement for fire sprinkler systems and certain assembly occupancies. Uh, the assembly occupancies that have uh, 300 or more people and, and in which alcoholic beverage is consumed are required to put a fire sprinkler system in that occupancy. Uh, the, the assembly occupancies that, that uh, this section speaks to are things like banquet halls, nightclubs, restaurants, bars, things of that nature. Uh, these occupancies all have uh, the same common characteristics uh, that have elevated risks to fire and life safety. Uh, for example, high noise levels, low lighting levels, large numbers of people, and the fact that these people could be inebriated um, could affect their egress and actually delay egress in the event of a fire. Uh, are elevated fire uh, risks as well. Uh, there's a high, typically, um, there's a potential for a higher fuel load uh, to be present in these occupancies due to furnishings and decorations. Uh, when we took a look at this section, uh, our staff identified five uh, occupancies or five buildings here in the community that would be affected by this requirement. Uh, those include the Houston Street Ballroom, Wareham Opera House, Eagles Club, the American Legion, R.C. McGraw's, and the Blue Hills Room. Uh, hopeful that we might have some of the representatives of those properties here tonight but I'm not sure if we do uh, the uh, little bit of background behind this section making it into the code um, there's been uh, over the course of history there's been several fires of this in occupancy similar to these that have resulted in large uh, loss of life uh, the coconut grove fire in Boston in the 40s killed nearly 500 people uh, fire, a fire at the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Kentucky in the 70s killed 165 people. 
the station nightclub fire in Rhode Island that occurred in 2003 uh, was uh, there have been several code changes in the, in the last few cycles that have resulted from that fire. There were 100 people killed uh, in that uh, in that incident, uh, and then more recently, uh, the Ghost Ship Collective uh, fire in Oakland that killed uh, 36 people. So uh, there is a risk there. Uh, I think uh, this section. Um, uh, is warranted based on the, the historical evidence we have of fires um, taking places in those occupancies. Uh, when we identified those buildings within our community, I, I did meet with the representatives from those properties to explain the code requirement. Um, uh, did my best to, to explain uh, why it was being introduced in the code, uh, and then also to gain feedback from them um, if we would uh, adopt that section of the code. It goes without saying, it's very understandable. The biggest concern I received was over cost. Uh, I did do my best to figure out if there were any grants available at the federal or state level. Uh, it was unsuccessful. I don't believe there are any, uh, specifically for installation of fire sprinkler systems. Uh, however, the 2018 tax reform law uh, does contain a, a significant uh, tax incentive for small business owners that, that uh, uh, install fire sprinklers uh, in the building. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe you can write off that cost all in that first year. Uh, so I, I took that information and distributed it to the folks that were representing these properties. Uh, we gathered some estimates from some of our local fire sprinkler contractors. Uh, those estimates, uh, it's anywhere from 4 to $5 a square foot to retrofit a building with a, a fire sprinkler system. Uh, I'll tell you that doesn't include the cost of the underground of getting the water to the building. There's a lot of variables uh, that can affect that cost, uh, just proximity to the water main. Uh, if the water mains under the street, how big the underground needs to be. Uh, so, um, but we did get some estimates that the cost of that underground can be upwards of seven thousand dollars to get done. So there, are, there is certainly significant cost uh, to getting this accomplished. Uh, understanding that, uh, we've uh, uh, we're proposing an effective date for this specific section, uh, January one of 2025. Uh, that would give folks five years uh, to. Uh, raise the funds, uh, get the design work done, and get the systems installed. Uh, this kind of mimics, as I mentioned earlier, the requirement for high-rise buildings. Uh, it basically sets a, a date by which it needs to be uh, completed. Uh, reached out to uh, some other uh, cities that have adopted this uh, section of the code uh, just to see what they did with time frame wise The way the section is really written now, it would take effect immediately when you adopted it, which is not practical at all. Um, so. Uh, Lawrence has, has adopted this section of the code. They gave a two-year window uh, to get that accomplished. And Olathe hasn't adopted it yet, but they're in the process and they're proposing a one-year window. Uh, so uh, certainly we're, we're sensitive to that cost and just the logistics of getting the systems installed in some of these buildings. Uh, so that's why we're uh, uh, proposing essentially a five-year period to get that accomplished. I'd also point out that the government body does have the ability uh, to uh, alter that effective date um, if desired. Uh, or to alter the section entirely in between first and second reading. So. Uh, it's always nice to point out that code changes, uh, uh, some of them, as mentioned on the last one, do result in some, uh, some expense, but uh, there are changes that occur with every code cycle that actually uh, may uh, provide a, a reduction in cost. Uh, one specific uh, change in the International Mechanical Code, uh, they've refined the definition of what commercial cooking operations are, uh, what that means. Uh, commercial uh, cooking establishments have to have very expensive uh, exhaust hoods uh, put over the cooking equipment. Uh, so when we define what commercial kitchen, what commercial cooking is or is not, that can greatly affect whether or not those hoods need to be installed. So I think that definition now will, will better equip us to evaluate those situations and, and may result in us not installing those hoods when, uh, by definition, in the mechanical code, it's not necessary. Question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so one of the local examples was that the state fire marshal came through and uh, required a range hood, was the story I heard. It, so how does that work? You wouldn't require it with the building code, but the state fire marshal would? Well, so we've got, we have a memorandum of understanding with the state fire marshal's yeah. office that okay. we do our, we do the inspections on behalf of the state fire marshal. Uh -huh for a laundry list of uses within the community. Okay. Uh, so theoretically, they should not be coming in and doing that. Uh, we've clarified with the State Fire Marshal's Office that we use our adopted code when we do those, and we don't use the state's yeah. adopted code to do that. Cool. So uh, I know that's happened in the past. Uh, that's part of the reason why we want to 
we want to do those inspections. We okay. don't want two different entities in there telling people okay. two different things to do. So uh, generally speaking, that shouldn't happen unless it's a facility that we don't do the inspections on. The hospital is a good example. Uh, that's one that we don't do I'm the inspections on. I think you have the senior on. center. Uh, we would, I think, theoretically still do that one. Uh, that would be on our list. So okay. can I jump in? That, that was our actually our own inspection. Okay. And it was based on when they were remodeling it that we okay. said that had to go to that. Uh -huh. So what the state fire marshal wasn't involved with that. That was actually There's apparently a backstory. I did that. It was before the remodel. <laughs> <laughs> there was an issue back in history. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. you bet. Uh, food waste grinders, uh, commonly what we would call, call a garbage disposal. Again, in those commercial kitchen applications, uh, if you're producing grease-laden waste, you have to have a uh, grease interceptor installed uh, so that uh, your waste goes through that interceptor before entering the city sanitary sewer uh, the code no longer requires a sink that uh, has a food waste grinder on it to drain through that grease interceptor uh, the savings with that uh, typically if you were going to take a sink with a garbage disposal on it through a grease interceptor you had to add another device in that actually separated out the solid so that it didn't uh, plug up the grease interceptor uh, so that device would no longer be required uh, I'd also tell you that that device requires continual maintenance or it doesn't work uh, so that will uh, eliminate the need for those type of devices. Uh, we have spoke with Public Works that are aware of that requirement, um, and they had no issue with uh, with that. Uh, there's uh, the 2018 International Residential Code contains an appendix now that recognizes construction of tiny homes. Um, the uh, that's actually, as I mentioned earlier, that was one of the things that, that uh, Deputy Chief Clausen and I got to, or Assistant Chief Clausen and I got the chance to vote on. Um, I think uh, for a lot of folks, they feel that's a long time coming in the code. Uh, what that appendix does is allow for smaller room sizes, uh, some reduced ceiling heights for lofts, and even uh, ladders for accessing loft areas and things like that. So just a few examples. Uh, I will tell you that it still requires those homes to be site built and put on a foundation so it wouldn't recognize anything on wheels that was brought in or something that was built off site and brought in. Uh, and uh, I will caution you, it probably does not permit everything you've seen on TV, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's always new materials and methods that are that are um, that hit the market um, every year. Uh, generally speaking, that gives more options and, and can generally drive the cost of construction down. So, uh, again, the, just recognizing those new, new materials um, uh, may uh, reduce the cost over the long run. All right, so moving kind of out of the nuts and bolts of the, of the codes themselves, uh, we also took this opportunity to look at some of our fees that we assess uh, in, our, in our operations. Uh, first, uh, the, uh, our miscellaneous permit fees, we're proposing an increase from $15 to $25. Uh, those, those permits would include electrical permits, plumbing permits, mechanical permits. Uh, so for example, if you got a new water heater or a new furnace, this would be the type of permit we would issue and, and do the inspections with. Uh, what we found is the uh, that $15 fee, which has uh, been there since 1997, uh, doesn't recoup the costs of, of actually needing to perform the, the services we perform for those permits. So uh, we're proposing to uh, raise that fee to $25. Uh, very commonly uh, with construction projects, as we start nearing the point of final inspection, uh, we have occupants that are very eager to get in their building. Oftentimes there's timelines for stores when they need to open, things like that. Uh, when we do our final inspection, if uh, they're, it's very common that you'll have a uh, few items that aren't completed, but they're not life safety oriented. Uh, in those cases, uh, we still want them to complete those items, but we issue what's called a temporary certificate of occupancy to allow uh, them to occupy the building for a duration of time. Uh, after that duration of time is up, or before then, we'll go out, uh, re-inspect, and if those uh, items are all taken care of, we'll go ahead and close the permit out and issue the full certificate of occupancy. What we run into are there are times when we go back out and those things are still not done. Uh, there's times when we will go out two or three times and stuff still won't be done. So uh, the problem with that is not only it's taking the staff time to, to continually go to those, those sites, but it's also taking that staff away from inspections that are ready that we could be doing uh, if they weren't tied up with, with uh, those rechecks. Uh, we broached this topic with the uh, Flint Hills Area Builders Association. The fees that you see there uh, were a direct result of that meeting. Um, and then when we met with the uh, Code Appeals Board um, here last month, uh, they were supportive of those fees as well. So it'd be $250 if we have to reissue that temporary certificate of occupancy. If we have to come back and do it again, each one of those would be $500. So certainly these fees are, are meant to be a deterrent 
uh, from that process just uh, continuing to unfold. So, uh, finally, uh, uh, plan review fees. Uh, we receive a lot of calls from um, out-of-town uh, designers and contractors. Plan review fees are very common um, across the United States. Uh, essentially what that is is when you apply for a building permit, you pay a fee up front to have the plan review done, um, and then there would be another fee that you would pay when you actually issued the building permit. Uh, what we're proposing to do actually isn't raising any fees, it's just uh, managing on how we collect those fees. Uh, essentially what we would want, what we're proposing is that 30% of the building permit fee would be paid up front. Uh, and then once the plan review was done and the permit was ready to be issued, the, the remaining balance of that permit fee would be uh, paid and, and the permit be issued. Uh, what we've ran against uh, from time to time uh, is that we'll spend uh, several hours doing the review for projects that never come to fruition. Uh, so this 30% would recoup some of that cost if we have a project that went all the way through the review but never got permitted. So again, this doesn't raise any fees. Um, it simply just um, handles how we collect those fees. Uh, I would mention too that we did check around uh, with cities uh, in the area. Uh, Wichita, Emporia, Salina, Lawrence, Hutchinson, Junction City, and Topeka. Uh, we checked with of those groups. Uh, Emporia is the only one that doesn't charge uh, plan review fees. And uh, there are several of those uh, cities that actually charge a plan review fee on top of what their building permit fee is. So uh, again, we're not electing to do that. Uh, we, our fee is essentially staying the same, it's just on how it's being collected. We do have some proposed changes to our uh, ordinances that uh, govern uh, contractor licensing here in Manhattan. Uh, to start off with, uh, we're proposing uh, actually two new licensing categories. Uh, the first being uh, demolition contractors. Uh, Essentially, just like it sounds, this would be a license that's issued to an individual or an entity to demolish structures in the city. Uh, it's worth noting, too, that on that, um, uh, within that ordinance, we've also made uh, an addition that um, if you're going to demolish a house and, and remove the basement and that, that excavation in doing so is deeper than uh, 36 inches, uh, that we have to have compaction reports for the fill material that goes back in. That ensures that that site is buildable uh, when, uh, when somebody would come back to redevelop on the site. Uh, I'd also note, too, that uh, licensed contractors would still have the ability to do demolition work. They wouldn't have to obtain a second license as a demolition contractor. The second licensing category is for fireplace installers. Uh, we have a, a, there are companies out there that that's all they do is, is install fireplaces. Uh, the way our ordinance reads now, um, that work would have to be done by a licensed mechanical contractor. Uh, we recognize that it doesn't take all of the knowledge and expertise of a, a mechanical contractor to, to install fireplaces. It's a very acute, uh, has a pretty small set of guidelines out of the code that, that need to be followed. Uh, so we did find out that there's a current certification that's available through the National Fireplace Institute uh, that we could use, um, will use as our, our certification guidelines. It would essentially require uh, those folks to get licensed, have a valid certification through that organization. Uh, and then they'd be free to do that work. Uh, again, a mechanical contractor could still do that work. They wouldn't have to obtain a separate license to install fireplaces. So. Then finally, uh, we're proposing to make a change to our ordinance uh, regulating general contractors. Uh, we're proposing to uh, add a requirement for continuing ed hours uh, for recertification. Uh, those licenses are, are renewed every two years, and so we've set forth minimum uh, continuing ed hours uh, that would need to be uh, submitted along with the application to renew the license. Uh, this essentially puts general contractors in line with the rest of our contractors or mechanical contractors, electricians, plumbers. They all have to have uh, uh, continuing ed hours, so this would put um, our general contractors in line with those folks. Um, the, uh, I will tell you that our office does provide um, continuing education opportunities throughout the year. Uh, this is kind of a win-win. Uh, this keeps us in contact with and, keeps us engaged with the contractor community and this also gives them the ability to gain continuing ed hours. So uh, that exists and will we'll continue as well. We're proposing an effective date. Uh, we've done this, I believe, the last two <coughs> code cycles uh, of uh, making an effective date um, of January 1 of the following year when we, um, when we approve the, uh, the, the code adoption. Uh, this gives people time to prepare for some of the changes to, to further educate themselves uh, and to make for a smoother transition to that code. Uh, so with the exception of the fire sprinkler uh, effective date that I mentioned that was 2025, the rest of the codes we are proposed to take effect in 2020. Yeah, 
to answer any questions if there's any. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, I think, well, where does all of this fall in with the UDO? Oh, you know, we're going to get the UDO as far as all the zoning areas and the codes and everything was supposed to be simplified. And some of these are going, well, these are going to be into effect in 2020. So does this also progress right along with UDO things, so or is the, that completely separate? Yeah, from the discussing? UDO will reference reference uh, some, something shall comply with the building code or whatever, but essentially they're two separate documents. Um, the If we have definitions that, that fall between the two, so if we have a de definition in our building code and it also exists in the zoning ordinances, we try to make sure that those two jive so that there's no conflict. Uh, but uh, all being said, they're, they're, they're completely separate. So. Because it was supposed to kind of simplify some of those things, that's what I was thinking. Um, you talked about the major uh, significant cost to businesses, and that's why we're not doing some of those fire codes until 2025. Mm -hmm. I think that's a reasonable um, compromise uh, on our, as well as um, the estab five establishments that you mentioned. Uh, if, if they don't comply within that 2025 frame, what happens? What is there a fee or is there, what uh, is? There's different ways that can be handled. So I, I would tell you that my, my intention would be that we would stay in contact with those folks. It'd probably just be a, a yearly reminder on my calendar to touch base with them and see what progress they've made. <laughs> Uh, I don't expect that some of these people are just going to jump all over this right away. So, uh, but certainly when we start getting into that last year, if, if that thing's been accomplished, that contact's going to increase. Uh, it's essentially, uh, I mean, you could vacate a building if you if it really came down to that. Uh, and if we had to, I mean, that would be the recourse that we would take. Um, uh, but I, essentially, it would be written up as a violation of the fire code. Um, they would be given a period of time to, to rectify it. If they didn't, they would they could be issued a citation and. and go that direction right. and safety is the the priority here so right. I understand completely why we're doing it and during that time when they have to put some of those uh, comply with the new codes uh, they probably have to shut down for a period of time so that's a loss of business They're, also on their side right. so um, I wanted to see how they move forward with some of these initiatives the, and I the I'm glad you brought up loss of business um, that's a that's one of the hidden costs that people don't consider when they have a fire too is loss of business. Right. So, um, I, you know, there's going to be a loss of business to put the system in, but I think that outweighs the loss of business if you had a fire and possibly closed permanently. So exactly. No, I, I think safety is first. You talked about the lockdown drills in schools. I know some of the modifications we've made uh, at Ogden and some of the other, uh, all of the schools at USD 383 is making sure you can lock from the inside as well as from the outside. And some of those uh, classrooms have doors where you can vacate a room from from the inside without having to go through a hallway. So right. I know all of those are coming, and all of those are extremely costly as well. And I think that's some of the things the USD 383 looked into, and they made uh, the the bond initiative that went forward for some of those. Um, the the changes that they've incorporated into the code are are useful for new buildings. Right. Um, I, the challenge is is what do you do with door hardware in an existing building, um, and. and I can't tell you that the fire code with this with these updates is is, a, is addressing that, um, but it certainly is at least beginning that conversation and, and moving in that direction. So yeah, no, I think it's going in the right direction. We've we've made several modifications. I don't have a problem with all the codes you proposed as long as there's also that window and you know best on how to educate all the um, people that need to be involved in some of these modifications. I didn't know uh, there was some. I don't use grills a lot, so I didn't know about the charcoal grills and how often they're being used and not having a sprinkler system on those balconies where it can easily, it seems like a, uh, a non-issue when people are doing it, but I realize there's lots of fires that happen from it as well. So I'm glad we're implementing uh, things that are pertinent to even individuals um, that don't have a business and that just do it for, for leisure activities. So I think it's made clear. And as long as everybody knows uh, what's going on and think we give them a certain time frame to implement these policies it's in the best interest of, of the community and safety all around and it will be costly like you said on the front end but in the long run we won't lose any lives or have any major injuries uh, to structures either so. Just a couple of quick things. Am I on there? Okay. Um, 
when we implement this in January, does that mean for things like the carbon monoxide uh, detectors that we have uh, six or seven months to put those in place? There's no wear in after that. That's a yeah. So that one's kind of that effective date is essentially when that code goes into effect. Um, there's an educational period there. Mm -hmm. um, the you know we're going to come across most of that stuff either on a property maintenance inspection where, where we're requested to come in and do an inspection. Uh, we may run into them in, during fire inspections. Our fire inspectors don't get inside the dwelling units, um, so that may not be something that comes up real frequently in those. But uh, there's an educational period there that uh, certainly we want people to get them installed, but uh, we have to be receptive to some of those people don't know that rule, so it's going to be a, a new requirement. So. For these uh, places that you cited that we need to make some improvements, this, you mentioned five, but I'm sure there's assembly halls that are sometimes have a very large occupancy and I know in here we have these emergency exit lights that flash to, to identify them. Is that one of the code requirements that we have for um, the <coughs> private buildings that have large occupancies or private uh, companies that do this? So exit signs specifically, is that what you're asking right. about? Yeah, so uh, exit signs, uh, illuminated exit signs are required any time a, a space needs two exits. Uh, that's when they kick in. So um, uh, yes, they're required both in a public and a private building. And on your reissuance of these uh, temporary occupancies, is that something that the contractor schedules with you or do you have a time period in between where you want to get it solved? Yeah, there's a, there's a a decided upon time period that we're comfortable with and that the contractor's comfortable that they can get those things taken care of. Uh, that's that's a condition of that temporary certificate of occupancy. Um, the uh, We obviously keep that within reason. I mean, we're not going to let somebody set one for a year or anything like that. But um, but yeah, the contractor's aware of it and they're aware that they need to schedule those, uh, that reinspection before that time period expires. And uh, you use the term fireplace installer. Does that include the person that hooks the gas up? In other words, does he have to be qualified to uh, to uh, hook up the gas properly, or is that still so? To the else? If, if it's simply just making the gas connection from the appliance to the piping network that's there, uh, that installer could do that. If we had a case where there was no gas supply in the area and you had to actually route pipe to it to to provide the fireplace, you'd have to have a uh, a licensed contractor okay. do that portion for you first. So. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me ask uh, if there's any public comment on this item. Anything from you, Brad? No? All right. Close public comment and come back to the commission. With no further discussion, we can have a motion. I'll just make one, uh, just a quick comment. So first, thank you for the thorough explanation of all of this. I've spent uh, more time in the last two years looking in, at codes and discussing codes than I had originally planned. Um, and I'm not a builder and I'm not a contractor, so sometimes it doesn't always make sense. So I, I uh, appreciate you explaining those. Um, in terms of all the proposals that are in here, um, the standard that I have used is if there is a good argument that this um, um, is good for life and safety and mitigates risk, uh, then it should be included. That's a standard that the public um, is okay with in many other private industries. I think of something like airlines. Anytime an unfortunate event happens and a safety improvement is identified, there's never a question that Boeing and Airbus are going to have to make those safety improvements, period. It always happens. Um, and we should hold that same standard for something as important as buildings. Um, and because we do that, People know that there's mechanisms running in the background um, that help ensure their life or at least mitigate the risk. So it's the reason that I don't walk into buildings and count how many uh, sprinklers are on the ceiling. Um, and it's the same reason when I go to the airport, I don't ask to hang off the wing to make sure it's screwed on tight enough uh, because we're supposed to be ensuring that those things are done properly. So I appreciate the explanation of all of this um, and the work that you did um, uh, to put this together. Thank you. Yeah. I, I too appreciate the the time you've spent with those and the community that work in in <coughs> in the building and and, and uh, trades area uh, because they have to know when they're in the middle of building what the requirements are so that when you come you don't uh, have to reject anything. That's the general idea. Uh, I am supportive also of the. Um, I guess the, the five-year implementation of the sprinklers uh, for large 
buildings that hold over 300 people, I think. Uh, I look at some of those buildings and think that they could not afford it in six months, and at least this way they can save some money over time and, and uh, implement it in a way that's meaningful, and we will be, as a community, making progress with regard for, uh, moving forward towards safety and we don't want a disaster like some of those other communities have had. So uh, I support what you're proposing. Thank you. So no, I, I'm in support of these as well. I'm glad we're having some fees also to take care of some of those charges for our uh, staff time that goes into some of these things. When you look around other communities, I think uh, they may or may not be adopting as many codes as we do, but it's apparent. You get what you buy, you, you, you pay for, uh, what you get is what you pay for, uh, is what I'm trying to say. There are a lot of surrounding communities that don't have the codes that we do, and we may go above and beyond at some, in some of the areas, but I think that's why some of our prices may be higher on some of our properties, because we put in so many codes to keep people safe. And when you look in some, some other regions, you can tell the difference between some of their housing or some of their buildings than you do in Manhattan. So I'm glad we, we are doing what we're doing, and I'm glad of the community effort and the stakeholders that were at the table to help make these decisions as well. Okay, I'll make the motion. We approve first reading of ordinances adopting the 2018 editions of the International Code Package and the 2017 National Electrical Code and amending sections of the Code of Ordinances, City of Manhattan, Kansas, relating to the licensing and fees of contractors and demolition of structures. Second. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner McKee. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. We now move to item D. Item D is to consider a resolution number 060419D calling for a special question election regarding a general purpose permanent sales tax increase of 0.3%. And resolution number 060419E, establishing the process and procedures for the use of the sales tax <coughs> proceeds for significant projects to reduce the burden on property <coughs> taxes. And the presenter is Jared Wassinger. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. I'll be filling in for Jason Hilders tonight, Deputy City Manager. Um, as you said, we're considering two resolutions tonight. One, to uh, put a ballot question on the general election in November to consider that increase in the permanent sales tax rate by 0.3%, and then establishing a policy resolution that in the event that uh, was passed by the electorate would establish how uh, and govern how we would use those funds. Just to give you an idea for the agenda tonight, I'm going to go into a little bit of a background of why we're considering a permanent sales tax increase. As you recall, back in February, uh, the Finance Department, during their initial uh, budget outlook for 2020, uh, was telling the governing body and city administration to consider an alternative revenue source uh, as revenues have been stagnant or declining, uh, specifically uh, sales taxes. We've seen some declines in population and enrollment at K-State. Uh, we're going to go, you know, into, into that why a sales tax as opposed to a property tax, where we're going to use those funds on some of the s significant projects that we have occurring over the next seven to ten years that we're, uh, that we've been working on as well for the last five to ten years, um, and then look at the resolutions under consideration and a possible timeline for what would occur if, uh, you choose to pass the resolution tonight. We've really focused on um, six uh, significant uh, projects under consideration that are arguably are needed and, and possibly re required to do so over the next few years. Uh, the levy is, is a major one. Uh, we've been working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, I believe since 2005, Rob, uh, to, to raise the levy, and we've actually been uh, provided funds from the federal government through the, the WARDA Act, which is the Water Resource Development Act uh, that was passed by Congress. Uh, but that requires a match uh, that we provide about $10 million to raise that levy. Aggieville has been a, a community vision project for the, the community. There's been a lot of community input. We've ex expended a lot of funds to study this. We You recently just passed a couple um, 
agreements to start design for the garage in Aggieville, as well as some streetscape. The <coughs> runway expansion is scheduled here in the near future at the Manhattan Regional Airport, and that's going to be required by uh, the FAA in order to keep our status. Uh, the joint maintenance facility was something that we talked about this spring. We have very um, antiquated, depleted facilities that our staff are working at. We need to find a way to consolidate those in a new facility that is going to serve our employees and the community uh, and in a way that we can um, you know, hire really good employees that want to work for the city so that they can have a place to come and work that's, that, that's adequate. Uh, the Southeast Neighborhood Recreation Center, we've been doing studies uh, you know, as far back as 2015 with the Strategic Facility Improvement Plan that identified indoor recreation needs in the community. And then the North Campus Corridor, which is a you know, $40 million project that um, is going to expand a lot of roadways adjacent to NBAF and K-State. And we have a lot of partners with the North Campus Corridor. The state has committed to um, $4 million in funds, uh, K-State Athletics $3 million, and then we've also have the resolution of intent to use $10 million in city university funds over the next 10 years. So over the next uh, seven years, we're going to be starting to ramp up possible construction for these projects. And we're going to debt service those over the span of 20 years, which is going to span from 2020 to 2050 and how we finance those projects. Overall, the, that construction cost of, of those six projects is about $190 million. Uh, with We have a funding gap where the city needs to come up with about $50 million. How we come up with that has been what's up to, for consideration and how we've came to this plan of a sales tax as opposed to uh, property tax increases. Uh, that last bullet there just gives you an idea of that gap we're looking at on an annual basis. We're looking at that $3.3 million, $3 million range annually to fund these over the next uh, 30 years. And what we've looked at is a possible six mil increase to fund that as well as if we can increase the the sales tax by 0.3% permanently from 8.95 to 9.25. This is just a breakdown of that gap that we're trying to fill within each project. It also gives you an idea of while it's a $50 million gap up front from the construction cost estimates for those projects, when we debt service those over time, there's interest. So that's factored in. Uh, we've worked with our finance department to get a good understanding of with that interest over 20 years, how much are those payments going to be? And that's about $90 million. And that's where we got the $3.3 .3 million annually over 30 years that would get us to around, uh, would give us that cushion. Just so you know that that $3.3 .3 million annually is held uh, constant. It's, it's flat. There's no uh, increase factored into that. So if, you know, if sales tax and uh, increase over time, that could increase as well. While these are uh, city administration and community uh, priorities, I did want to just give you some preliminary results from the uh, 2019 community survey that was conducted, uh, just to give you an understanding of uh, the overwhelming support from the community uh, that these projects are supported. Uh, we asked about support for mitigating flooding, and we had uh, over 95% of respondents say that they supported or strongly supported that. Uh, over 65, uh, roughly, percent uh, support for the North Campus Corridor and 75 percent for uh, the Aggieville parking garage and pedestrian amenities and streetscape improvements. Uh, these results are preliminary, uh, but at the June 18th meeting, we're going to be presenting the full report and results to you about the community survey, just so you know. We did also ask, um, you know, over the last, we've done a lot of sales tax initiatives over the last couple of years with the street sales tax as well as the Parks and Recreation Quality of Life sales tax. And fortunately, those kind of aligned with our community survey. So in, in the 2015 survey, we asked about, would you support uh, increasing funding for street maintenance? In the 2017 community survey, we asked about the renewal, basically, of the quality of life, and if you would support funding those indoor recreation improvements, as well as the SECO improvements and trail improvements. And then this one aligned with um, the possibility of this 0.3% sales tax. This one was a little different because it's pretty vague, as you can see in the question. We don't have the opportunity to really necessarily get into the details of each specific project. Within these community surveys, you don't really want to educate people and create a very long question. So we, we tried to explain the best way we could that we're trying to keep the city's reliance on property taxes low 
if we increase the sales tax to fund you know major projects that are going to increase quality of life for residents um, you know would you support that additional tax and we had about 55 percent that said that they would support or strongly support that 38 percent with an uh, opposition or strong opposition and then six percent with don't know to give you an understanding of our current sales tax with the city it's at 8.95 percent right now one percent of that is a permanent uh, sales tax with for the city uh, 6.5 of that goes to the state um, and then it's broken up into the city and county sales taxes that one percent permanent generates about 11 million dollars annually that we break up over the uh, general fund to assist with operations personnel and then we also use it for other funds like the employee benefit fund KPNF and the general improvement fund of that 1% permanent sales tax, 0.5 was uh, approved by the uh, residents of Manhattan in 1971. And another time, there was an addition of 0.5% in 1982, which got us at the full 1%. Here you do have just a snapshot of the growth in sales tax revenues over the last six years. That's been anywhere from a decrease to a 2% increase uh, from year to year and on average it's about 0.9. So you can see that our sales tax revenues have been stagnant. Uh, prior to you know 2012, we were seeing large increases annually. K-State enrollment was growing annually as well. The Manhattan population was growing annually, but that has kind of tapered off and we see some decline. 2017 was one of the alarming years where we noticed uh, that the sales tax had really dipped and it affected our beginning cash balances. Again, here's just a breakdown of that 8.95%, how it's broken out to the state. That 1% that I just discussed, there's a half cent uh, Riley County general purpose tax. We have the Eco Devo tax that most of you referred to that's broken up for the county's roads and bridges, city economic development, and property tax reductions. That one that was passed in 2012 by the electorate was also accompanied by the city commission with a resolution of intent to guide the projects and how the funds were used, kind of like what you're considering tonight. And then we have those two uh, special taxes that are 10 years in length. They expire uh, and then can possibly be renewed in 10 years with the vote of the public, and that was the streets and quality of life, parks and rec. This is a breakdown of first class cities in Kansas to give you an idea of where we stand with our sales tax rate as compared to others. We're at 18 right now at a 25. If we approve this uh, ballot tonight and then the public approves it in November, it'll probably bump us right up here to that top 10. And then you'll notice here that the state also does a pull factor, which I'll discuss and Jason kind of talked about this last time when we were here at the work session but we have a 1.33 pull factor which is good that means visitors are coming into Manhattan and spending money on taxable goods and services and that is generating more sales taxes for our community uh, the city realizes 1.1 billion dollars in sales that was in 2018 so based off that pull factor we can estimate that about 270 million of that came from people who don't actually live in our community or 25 percent. The debate of sales tax versus property tax uh, you know has come up from governing bodies as we uh, address the city budget annually as well as projects and how to fund uh, you know these important projects that we're considering so what we've done was we did a breakdown of the the possible increase if the sales tax did increase by 0.3 percent Generally, uh, you know, research suggests that uh, people spend about 30% of their income on taxable goods and services. So what we did was we broke down, uh, you know, a possible annual household income, took that 30% of that income, about what you would spend on taxable goods, and then we broke it down of the existing sales tax rate and the possible 9.5. You know, so a person who makes $35,000 a year if this uh, sales tax initiative passes would see probably an annual difference of 32 more dollars a year on sales taxes. We did the same with property taxes uh, based off of uh, residential values as well as commercial values and then uh, we took the uh, and this is the mill levy for uh, the city the county and the school district uh, which is currently at uh, 148 mills 
So if you know the median uh, housing price here in Manhattan, according to the census, is about $190,000. So if you owned a $200,000 home, and we increase the mill uh, levy by six mills, uh, you would end up spending 138 more dollars a year in property taxes. So here's the ballot uh, question that's under consideration tonight during the work session. There was uh, some questions from city commissioners about how specific we should get within the uh, ballot question, as well as the length. The permanency was, uh, you know, something that. Uh, commissioners had questions about the city attorney's office did provide you a memo kind of explaining why we went this route uh, you know our, our attorneys took a, a lot of time uh, figuring out how to craft this question uh, the more specific you get the more legally binding it is which leaves less flexibility over time and then as we discussed earlier we're looking at a long haul of 30 years of debt servicing of these projects so a special question that would be 10 years in length wouldn't really meet those needs. The second resolution that's under consideration, like we did with the economic development, uh, Riley County sales tax in 2012, this kind of helps guide how we want to spend those funds in the event the public passes this. So it gives us the guidelines about how, and it lists out those projects uh, that we've talked about tonight, and it gives the commission the authority to make sure that those are the priorities which ones should be priority over others, and then if similar projects come up and available funding is there to consider other similar projects. A timeline, if this is approved tonight, really, you know, we're gonna start city administration, other departments who uh, have projects that are specific to this initiative. We're gonna get an education process going, and get out to as many people as we can to inform them about, uh, you know, this ballot initiative. As I said earlier, it, it, it's not a very specific ballot initiative, so we want to get in front of as many people as we can to educate them on why this is necessary, why it's important, the projects and their impact on the community and residents. And, um, and then come election day, uh, the voters can decide if they do want to see that increase, which would, uh, as you saw in the ballot question, it would go in effect April 1st, 2020. So with that, I can take any questions. Yeah, Jared, I have a few questions. So. I understand why we're trying to do this for the um, projects that we have in place. I have several questions as far as um, the second ordinance, the E, for prioritize for the projects. So I think we need to remove the word examples of significant projects. I think we need to say, oh, I'm sorry, not this, the one that has the, um, 060419-E, which yeah, has a, this is just a summary. Uh, I, if you'd like, I can okay. bring up the full Because the resolution. actual one has examples of significant, and I think the word example needs to probably be removed. So it has, these are definitely the priority. Uh, so when the community is presented with the ballot initiative, they need to understand that these are the projects that we, that at least I am thinking um, and if we can prioritize the levy and runway, I think our, um, they have a, a federal funding source uh, for both of them. And that's kind of one of the reasons we need to move forward with those. And that might take a little bit longer and maybe prioritize the others. The North Campus Corridor, I'm still very reluctant where that falls on the priority list. You mentioned uh, $4 million from the state commitment. What, what, what $4 million? So we, we received a grant from KDOT uh, that is going to be available, I believe, in 2021, and that's for phase 10 of the North Campus Corridor, which is for, uh, you know, that curve part in Kimball between Denison and North Manhattan. That's really a safety concern, and when you're driving down that road, right. you feel like you're about to get hit by an yeah. oncoming car. That, uh, I believe, is the, specifically for that phase. So that's, that's, that's that four. the $4 million. Yeah. And... Um, I know we are responsible for 26%, and I'm thinking that's where the $11 million came from. Is that right? Yep. So we don't have the star bonds yet, and I keep bringing that up. Until we get a firm commitment of star bonds, we're, that's 60% that we would be responsible for. And build grants are still out there, which we'll, we will reapply for. Um, we are reapplying for that, and that application is going to be due uh, this July. Right. So we're. And, and I think until that. we have those numbers fixed, uh, you said the uh, KDOT grant, 
uh, the city university funds and um, we're in the, the process uh, of that athletic, three million dollars from athletics yes yeah, the athletic one so those are concrete is what I'm thinking that are confirmed that we have so the other ones I'm kind of worried about where that falls in because I don't know if that 11 million is going to change uh, not just a million or two more I'm thinking drastically so I, I, I don't know when we will know that number but I think we need to be realistic about that um, because the public is going to be voting on this, I think we need to be clear exactly what it is they're voting on because on the actual one that uh, they're going to be saying yes or no to, it says to be used for all lawful expenditures of the city intended to reduce the impact on the property taxes, let's say. Um, I don't want it to be misinterpreted as though um, even the survey, there might be a misinterpretation. Somehow they won't have any mill levy increases because we are approving this. Mm -hmm. Those are, these are two different things that we're talking about. And so as we move forward with the budget this year and even next year and, and next few years, well, forever, um, that because this is passed does not necessarily mean uh, this is mainly for the bond and interest, I think is what we're trying to reduce here. Uh, so we don't have to increase property taxes to go towards those projects or any other projects that are coming up, whereas the mill levy uh, addresses different issues. Uh, so I want us to be clear about what exact, so there's no confusion. Yeah. When a community says, yes, I'm first raising the sales tax and it's going to reduce my property, it's not going to reduce their property taxes. That's totally different from what we're talking about here. So I just want us to be, that there should not be that backlash when this goes out. Um, and I think we also need to, in addition to this, we need to try to figure out how to collect on the online taxes and the dark store taxes, because that's going to impact our um, property tax issue also on this part. But that's a different issue when we will talk about budgeting, but I think that's something that needs to be addressed when we talk about all of these um, sales tax initiatives that we're trying to look at. And the uh, downtown has nine point something, and you mentioned the um, transportation districts and the community uh, deve interest development districts, improvement districts, they're already at 9.7 or 9.25 or something, right? For so sales the, tax? Yeah, if there's a transportation development district, it's likely at 9.45. Usually those are half cent. And then the CID, community mm -hmm. improvement district at the mall, would is at uh, 9.7. And the downtown one is, is that part of the TDD or is that different? I believe down. I thought downtown is also separate, isn't it? Uh, there's a north end TDD. Okay, so those are the two TDDs. statute. Okay, okay. So, I'd, so that's going to increase a little bit more than uh, in yep. some of those areas where they're purchasing it. So just being clear about what exactly this is going to go to. Um, and if we need to slow down on some of those projects, that's just what we have to do. But I want to make sure that we are clear on what this money is going to be going for. And this isn't a, a fund uh, just to put into everything else that's going on um, and on our budget line items. So I'll just make a couple of comments. I really don't have any questions, but um, I actually probably stand on the different side than this than Commissioner Reddy. I say the, pretty much the same two things every time that we talk about this, um, and I'll say it again. The first one is I actually have hesitation um, I support exactly how this language is written here, and I have hesitation how much we're relying on selling this by talking to the, pro uh, to the projects. I would love those projects to get done long term, um, but the reason I'm interested in this more has to do much more with the long term fundamentals of where the city's at. Um, you can stop spending on all outside agencies. You could stop all of our payments for various memberships, and maybe you can reduce the mill one year uh, uh, by three mills. But long term, unless we were to gut city staff, personnel costs alone are forcing us to raise a mill levy every single year. And we're going to force us to raise a mill levy every single year unless something fundamentally changes with the number of houses we have on the property rolls or the amount of sales tax we're bringing in. And I don't see either one of those things drastically changing in the near future. Um, and so while I understand it's easier to talk from the pro uh, project perspective, I want people to realize that this isn't just a choice about whether you want these projects to be done or not. This is a choice about you, fundamentally, what are the city services that you want to be offered? Um, because 
in many sections in our city, we are already understaffed in departments. Um, so I don't know how we continue to reduce that. So I think the language should stay as is uh, because there are things that we do need to add to the general fund budget line items to help pay for things like personnel to reduce the impact on the mill levy. The second thing I'll say, and I'll explain this a little bit more because someone asked me to clarify. I consistently say that I feel like in the city of Manhattan, uh, property tax can be just as regressive of a tax as sales taxes. And the reason why I say that is in many communities, um, property tax, you could always make the argument that if, you know someone making a $100 payment every month on property taxes, at least the rest of their mortgage is going to them building an equity into their property, right? It's an investment for them. Well, in the city of Manhattan, 60% of our people um, are print paying property tax through rents and they're not building equity in those homes, right? Uh, so that $103 of additional property tax that they're going to have to pay is not something that goes towards a long-term investment for them. So to me, that hits their pocketbooks much harder um, than an additional $11 or $25 that they would have to pay um, in sales tax. I think in different kinds of communities where that ratio is different. Um, I might have a different perspective on this, but in this kind of a community, we have to realize that a majority of our residents are paying property taxes and not building equity at the same time. Um, so I'm supportive of this sales tax written as is. Um, my only feedback was, I, I think we can talk about the projects, but I think we have to dig in a little bit more on the fundamentals of where we are in terms of budget at the city level. I have just one question. Is there a second reading on this? No, this is just a resolution, one time. An ordinance isn't required. You typically... Okay, because, uh, you know, I agree with what Commissioner McKee said. I'm, I'm, it's basically a fundamental outlook here. Are you going to fund the city through sales tax or property tax? Uh, I prefer sales tax over property tax, but... Commissioner Reddy said, you know, the, the current mill levy and this are, are separate, and I, I don't see it that way. I think it's physically impossible to probably uh, get voters to understand that if we raise the mill levy, and we started with a four mill discussion, and then we ask them to vote to raise sales tax, I don't think it's going to happen. So, you know, I, I'm, what troubles me here is you've got to send us to the county on 1 September. And I don't want to vote yes unless I see what the mill levy is going to be. Because to me, the two are not something I can separate. But I'm 100% for this. I like the way it's worded and all that. But my assumption would be we would see a minuscule increase in the mill levy. And if the voters, to, to make it crystal clear on the resolution, if they then do not vote for the sales tax, then they will not get a recreation center at the Douglas Center. We'd have to scrap it. We'd have to scrap the North Campus Corridor project. We'd have to scrap just about all of them, except maybe the mill levy, because we don't want to flood the city. And and that that's the way I see it. So unless I you know get a feeling that uh, we're going to do something uh, positive on the mill levy, as in not increase it four mills or three or two or even one, then I have trouble asking the voters to vote on this because they're going to say, you guys are just going to raise the sales tax and the mill levy, and there's no hope. And that's the feedback I'm getting. Um, this is a time, at least I think, when a lot of the communities in Kansas are have gone stagnant, and they are not growing. Their revenue, their sales tax is not growing. And if we want to keep Manhattan as a uh, destination and a positive place so that in conjunction with our university and Fort Riley in Bath, whatever, that we are a growing community, we, have to, we can't just stop and say we're not spending any more money. We have to uh, make our community presentable and in you know, what? make it better so others will come here and want to continue to come here for ball tournaments and K-State and, and the conferences that come here and to our hotels. That's part of our economy also and we can't stop that. Uh, we are dependent on it uh, to be a, one, of the, one of those top desirable uh, university communities in the country. Uh, uh, we have to keep our roads up, we have to do 
so I think that this commission, <clears throat> let me get back to our list of priorities. Um, the, levy the levy system is essential. There's $10 million we have to come up with because that's our share, our match with the federal government. Um, the runway at the airport is a, 90, I think, 90% federal and 10% uh, local match, but even that is three and a half million we have to come up with, or a total debt service of six million. Um, I at least am on record as supporting the Douglas Center or the Southeast uh, Neighborhood Center um, uh, because we faltered with regard to the funding for that. We didn't put it on that last referendum when the other two activity centers uh, went through. And so this is an opportunity, the only opportunity, um, to have it funded. Um, <clears throat> Our community certainly has a goal and has worked to Im Im improve Aggieville. And if you think about Aggieville, it has not changed in at least 100 years, probably. It is pretty much the same place it always was. And we are making a proposal to improve it. And not with bells and whistles and gold-plated anything, but we want it to be a, uh, the kind of place that people want to visit alumni coming here to revisit their past or the current students that are here. Uh, and we, it needs to be a healthier place. And um, the North Campus Corridor, I believe that our city commission is on record as having committed to that project. Painful as it is, it is a, uh, uh, a partnership with K-State and NBAF. We can't just leave things as they are up there. We're going to have endless traffic jams. We've got to think ahead. We already have students being treated differently by the, the crosswalk systems on the west side versus the east side. Those mechanisms, those crosswalk lights don't behave alike and so people can get hurt because we aren't being consistent. We have to do that. Uh, my lowest priority, you'll be sad to hear, to hear is the joint maintenance facility. <laughs> and I, 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 that doesn't, I want to accomplish that. Uh, I think that we should. I, too, want the employees that work for the city to have a, a very, um, uh, just an, a, a, a workplace that is reasonable. And I think that some of the, the uh, places that our employees work now are not reasonable. And I don't know that we've given any tours of some of those. <laughs> Ron, have we? <laughs> You've given us tours, but, but, but I don't think we've uh, given tours to the public. For instance, we can't get our fire engines in the mechanics shed to repair them. Um, we have to Anyway, it's just a, a complication is all, and, um, and it's uncomfortable, and uh, it's low ceilings, and uh, so these, I, I don't consider these wants uh, as we typically talk about what's wanted and what's needed. I really believe these are needed. I'm unwilling to um, pass a property tax that would uh, fund these programs these projects. So for me, it has to be the sales tax. And I believe that it's up to us as commissioners to have the courage to um, send this to the, uh, to the electorate. And it's up to the electorate to make a decision about the funding of it all. And if, the, if, if it, it doesn't pass, then there are a lot of other decisions that are going to have to be made. But uh, the, the citizens here have been uh, supportive of the needs of this city over the years, and I guess I expect them to continue to act in the best interests of our city. On this uh, ballot question, what are the timelines that we have to consider here, you know, so that we know 
how it fits with other things that will be coming along like the city budget. When do we need to get to, uh, to file it and those kind of things? Yep. So that's here. Um, we, we need to get this question to Riley County by September 1st. By what? By September 1st. Okay. Right here. Uh, the, and we're... One of the key aspects, though, is whether or not you have a definitive question that you can start educating right. folks on. So that's, well, that's that was one of the, the issues of waiting until the budget's done, which would be <coughs> two weeks prior to that. Well, that's what I recall. I mean, if you're going to, you can't just start in the middle of August. You've got to start in June. I think that's right uh, to educate the public. Otherwise, there be no information by the time it gets there. So, all right. The second one was, uh, Katie, maybe you can re just remind us when we talked before about the uh, temporary versus a permanent sales tax and what that means. and. Temporary uh, is temporary capped at 10 years, or is it? Uh, I mean, can you have a temporary 30 year, or how does that work? I think the distinction is between the special sales tax, which has a defined specific purpose in the question, and then the general sales tax, which is what we're considering adopting tonight or, or putting on the ballot tonight. The temporary has a 10 year period, it automatically sunsets. The general does not have an expiration period. However, the commission can repeal a general sales tax by the adoption of an ordinary ordinance. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, I appreciate that. Just wanted to do that for review. The, the other thing, my, I guess the fundamental question uh, for me was, um, it is not between adopting a sales tax and adopting a property tax, it's between adopting a sales tax and not doing projects. And I don't know if that is a legitimate ballot question or or not. You know, I, I understand what we're asking, but you know, we're, we're suggesting that these are a fait accompli and that we're going to either pay for them by sales tax or by property tax. And I, I'm sure everybody feels the same way that property taxes are probably not the way to go. So is this the proper question, is my question. Is this, is this the way it has to be done with it? I mean, I, I know that's why I asked Katie this to start with. If you've got this kind of a question and you're prohibited really from uh, delineating it too finely on what it's going to be spent for, right. then can you do that kind of a question? In other words, can you say uh, in order to do these specific, well, to do these types of projects, do you support a sales tax of 0 0.03? So uh, if I think I understand what you're, what you're asking is, you know, did you want to reflect that it's a sales versus property tax in the question? And so you, you would have other potential revenue sources besides those two on different projects you know one of the things we we even talked about early on even on the levy was maybe you use stormwater fees and mm -hmm. different aspects for that and so it's a little bit different I think and, and more difficult in a permanent tax to delineate that as opposed to how if you recall during the policy resolution for the uh, half cent Riley County tax for roads, infrastructure, and property tax reduction. That one we specifically delineated that a third of those proceeds were going to go for property tax reduction. So, and there was a previous question uh, of the half cent sales tax, I believe, one of the permanent ones that spoke. It wasn't in the question, I don't think, but it was certainly in the uh, information <coughs> that, the, that the city used to educate folks that it was, was specifically going to be a property tax offset if it was passed so it, it kind of depends on you know what you all feel comfortable with and whether or not it makes sense to make that commitment in the permanent question yeah yeah I, I would <clears throat> spend some time this afternoon trying to figure out how you would ask that question uh, without the comparison in other words not juxtapose sales versus property tax just juxtapose whether or not 
and sales tax. Yeah. And it, I, I, <coughs> with, with the provision of having uh, the provisions that are inside of a, a permanent, um, amend, well, permanent uh, sales tax, I just couldn't come up with anything. Right, and the other piece I didn't address was the, the issue of your, uh, whether you're gonna do the project or not. Some projects will be, you know, if you wanna take advantage, of, for example, the levy. We've already entered into a, an agreement, uh, a grant agreement with the federal government on the levy. Now, uh, and, and we've made a commitment that we're gonna come up with our share. I signed that. <laughs> At your direction. <laughs> But so so that one's probably not the type of project that you're not if or how or but but it's going to be how you're going to pay this for it. How, right. So yeah. there are others clearly where you have discretion to reduce the scope of the project. Um, airport's probably another one that eventually you're you're pri likely going to have to do some kind of project, and and some of those can be influenced. You know, we hope that we we know that the FAA is probably not going to give us one grant to cover a full one one project they're going to break it up so those are just nuances but certainly you have the ability to influence the scope of a project uh, which ultimately influences the cost of a project and I think Bill's yeah, probably Bill, got a better yeah. statement than I do what you're essentially asking mayor is how do we take a general sales tax question and make it look like a special sales tax question and that is fraught with legal issues. Because if you do that, if we take this, because the rules are different to those two taxes. The specific rule is the special tax expires in 10 years and the general one doesn't expire until you repeal it. If you make a general sales tax question look like and have the features of a special t sales tax question, you open yourself up to a legal challenge. Somebody's going to challenge that and say, you've asked a special question. Now you're limited to 10 years. And that's what we're trying to avoid yeah. uh, by doing the ballot question and then a resolution that says, here's how we intend to spend it. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks. Can, can you put that um, D back up? Um, one of the questions that came up is kind of how you separate this and when you get down to the third line from the bottom and intended to reduce the impact of the ad valorem property tax burden for and can you put in things like these um, project expenditures that go along with item D or do you does this get back to confusing the issue again you know the question that you asked was, yeah I mean is this thing again is a balance between property tax and sales tax and doesn't relate it to the item E you're mixing yeah. those again which creates questions we had a large discussion in staff about this what you don't want to do is suggest in this ballot that you are reducing somebody's property taxes mm -hmm. what it says is it's reducing the impact yeah. on property taxes um, so what I'm thinking is we know that yes the person that's going to vote on this won't know that all they will see is uh, sales tax and reduce property tax. They're going to be selective in what they see unintentionally. Right. So when another budget comes and a mill levy is increased, let's say, they'll say, well, wait a minute, I just approved the sales tax. Why in the world are they increasing my mill levy? Which is why this language is a legal document. It's not an educational tool. Right. We're writing it in a manner that can be defended. If that person comes forward and says, wait a minute, I thought I, I, thought I was reducing my property taxes. The response is no, it didn't say that. It said it reduced the impact on your property taxes. So I think when we, if, if uh, um, when we, when this goes to the public, 
E has to go along with this. E in the sense for the education purposes, it, not as about it. Correct. But E is a very key component of this, kind of like a, the rec design when you're trying to sell the parks and rec design or street maintenance. You're selling unit you know, where all the maintenance. So that project, in my opinion, that project <coughs> list has to go with it. Otherwise, um, it, it it needs to be clear. But it has going. to be separate from the ballot language. Right, but when it has to simply be a policy. The that education part of it needs to yes. have that as the key uh, white paid piece that goes to everybody. Because um, as a layperson, if I vote on this, that and when I get a survey, and that's all I'm going to see, my eyes are going to go to reduce property tax because now I have a sales tax. So I just want to be clear about that, and as many ways as we can, because I. They need to know exactly what they're voting on without uh, misinterpreting or being misunderstood. And that, that, that's what I want to make sure people know exactly what, what, it, what this is for, at least from this commission, at, at least from my, my perspective. I understand. This. They're voting on what that says, and they're relying on the commission to stick with the policy that's a part of it. That's for future commissioners. Absolutely. Because we won't be here. I understand. 30 years. 20, 30 years. Well, this is for the next 22. Because by the time the North Campus Corridor all goes into effect, we'll probably have several new commissioners. Yes. And you won't have me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Appreciate it, Katie. All right. Uh, we want to go to the Public or? Sure, okay. public come. All right, well, let's, uh, on this uh, item D, let's please go to the public and see if there's any comment from anyone in the public on this issue. Joe Knopp, I'm a broken record. Um, <laughs> If you're going to really reduce the impact on property taxes, then you can't do the projects. You've got two dilemmas here. One is, as mentioned last time, you've got all these pressures on your property tax levy this time to even stay underneath the mill, uh, underneath the the, uh, the tax limit to fund normal operations. And if you commit all of this money to these extravagant projects then you're spending that money and then you're going to have to operate them and that just increases the burden increases the burden on your property taxes not reduces it i would if if you're going to make this a referendum on the on the projects then that's that's fine um, <clears throat> you know I, I stand before you again and say that having three recreation centers is extravagant especially when you've got a ninth grade center that's empty and, you know, Commissioner mentioned that it's a great opportunity for YMCA. Well, YMCAs are privately funded, and they are privately endowed, and they're privately operated by people who really want them. In our community, when you want something, like a Norvell Band's Concert Center, with the Johnny Caw statue, the zoo, a welcome center, you can just Peace Memorial, private individuals raise money and show that they want that facility. What you've done for the Douglas Center and the other two recreation complexes who have private competitors who are willing to provide that service for a reasonable fee, you've said you get this for free without having to prove that you can raise any money. And the Fieldhouse Group couldn't raise any money. They couldn't raise any money, they couldn't raise $50,000 to do the feasibility study. Went to the Chamber of Commerce to do that. So we went to the public and we raised the money. We, we said, do you want to vote for it? And what you're going to do is happen to this, that the people are going to vote for this. You're going to threaten to raise their property taxes and not tell them that we're going to raise your property taxes no, what, no matter what because our past trends tell us that we have to do that and we're going to continue to do that. I did a little bit of research this afternoon and, and the city budget is so easy to compare between years from 2011 to 2019, our population went up 4.8%. The consumer price index went up 14%. Full-time and part-time employees in the city of Manhattan went up 22.8%. Expenditures per capita went up 79%. 
the city proportion of the mill levy went up 144 percent. The total city mill levy went up 17 percent versus 4.4 percent increase in population. The general fund, the property, the property tax, went up 37 percent, and the total city budget went up 48 percent. Now I'm not, you know, everybody's not. You guys, that were eight years, you guys weren't totally responsible for that's going to happen. I can guarantee you that's going to happen over the next eight years. Einstein said the most powerful force in the universe is the power of compounded interest. And when you increase the city budget by two or three percent more than the population and by the and more faster than the, than the uh, consumer price index each year, that dramatically increases. So we know we're going to have a property tax increase. The question is how are you going to spend it? And I'm here tonight to ask you to think about not doing the Douglas Center. Think about finding some way to save money on your, your maintenance projects. Think about some way to spread out the timing of these other projects. Um, at some point, MBATH has got to create some money for us. You put $11 million into the North Complex, another $11 million. I mean, at some point, that's going to kick in. I would just share with you, the last eight years, I've had one person come in that was employed by, connected with MBATH, and it was an iron worker from Iowa. And he, I t came in for a divorce, and I said, go home to your wife, get a job with a union closer to home, hug your kids, and I never saw him again. That's the only impact. If you drive by that project up there, you see Johnson County, Colorado, Sedgwick County, other trucks. I mean, I just, well, anyway, that's, that's another topic. But the, but the point is, hold the line. Hold the line on spending. I don't think we have a revenue problem as much as we have a spending problem. And I would hope that you could, you could help us figure that spending problem out and focus on property tax and operating city government and not just on building more projects. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Anyone else, please? All right, well, we'll close the public comment and come back to the commission. Uh, the only additional comment I want to make real quick is um, the perspective that I am coming from in supporting this sales tax is not necessarily for the projects. We, we have to evaluate those one-off they, as they come before us because there are other funding mechanisms that we're waiting to see are going to become available for us or not. Uh, but we cannot change the fundamentals of how the city budget operates um, without more uh, revenue going into the general fund. And I, and I would encourage people to watch the budget um, as we get into it. Um, and I hear a lot, reduce city, uh, city spending, reduce city spending. Uh, but if you take these projects out that we largely haven't spent a lot of money on yet, where do, where do we reduce it? I've already pointed out a couple of places that we could reduce it that gives you a Band-Aid for maybe a couple of years. But the long-term fundamentals and what we have working with in terms of personnel, there's no way to do it unless revenue randomly just organized organically uh, generates or we reduce our personnel costs, um, which I don't really see as an option either, um, seeing how the impact that uh, the hiring freeze had last season, um, I couldn't imagine the amount of employees reduction that we'd have to do to make an impact. So uh, I still have the hesitation on how we approach this from a pros uh, project perspective um, because we need this to long term change our fundamentals. The, the only other comment I'd make is that uh, we're at the beginning of uh, these projects that are going to extend for the next 30 years. So we're making a decision tonight, not that we're going to start funding these tomorrow, but they're going to be in some sequence, hopefully prioritized, and progress in a way that makes sense to the community. And I agree with uh, Linda that we're in a time now where if we stand still, we're going to regret it in three or four years. Um, I mean, there are a lot of economic theories out there, but the one that I advance, I would rather be spiraling up than spiraling down. So adding to the power of the city is important, not only for itself, but to 
uh, add property, add more people, all those things we need to do to attract businesses and and uh, and employees to our community so that the net is that we gain even more property uh, taxpayers and, and more sales tax. So in that regard, Jared, I think you've got the right idea, and that is we've got to find a way to generate more income by having more people and more business. So um, any further discussion? Or? I wanted to make just one, one comment. Again, I, I see it as a strategic you know, concept of do you, you know, run the city through sales tax, property tax. It's a it's a long term shift, and, and I prefer the, you know, the sales tax route for for a number of reasons. I think you know, giving this to the voters, as Commissioner Moore said, you know, they're going to make the decision. We're not, we're just deciding to put it on the ballot. But but I think the education process, uh, the number one thing on that education process, is going to be what will be the mill levy this year. And if that goes up substantially, then I don't think this got a prayer passing. Yeah. So, you know, we have two resolutions. I know one of them, the the um, question, special question, that probably doesn't have a second reading, right? This is it. Neither do. But for for E, can't we? Why is that's not part of the question, though? Right? Why can't we? have a second reading on that because I would like to see those projects prioritized. So I mean you could choose not to do the second resolution. I mean one option would be to table it if you can all concur that there ought to be some adjustments. You're just delaying that education process. So um, that would be, you know, and, and if you want to prioritize, I, I know, I don't know how the other, none of the other commissioners have commented about the wording there, about examples, you know, of potential alternative uh, might be significant projects to be considered include but may not be limited to. I would like, I would agree with you, Sha, about removing the word example because these are our intent. Um, and, but I do think it is important to that we, in some way, prioritize the projects, um, as she suggested. Um, um, so the levy may be the highest priority because it's coming first. I don't, I don't know that, but I think we need some of the staff's input with regard to how we might prioritize uh, what is the highest, lowest of the of those. Ex I, those I do just items. want to add that the, the projections over the next 30 years exceed the cost of all six projects. So right now, based off the projections, we have enough funds for all six. So that may factor in to whether you feel that there's a need or not to prioritize it. Could moment. you put the resolution up there? On the, I, not not that one. The one that uh, the e. expense guidelines, the one with the E on it there that we're talking about. One of the challenges with prioritizing. I'm not saying that's not a reasonable like exercise. It's just uh, most of these are more likely on a chronological timeline, at least currently. Um, so and so you up. have some that are well into back, design. But some that have completed design and are ready to bid, others that are just starting design, uh, and others that haven't been designed at all. So uh, that's really more the timeline for as those projects would, would come to you as far as, you know, maybe may there's actually just meant to slide. an A group or a B group. I don't know. I just, it, it gets, again, conveying what that means, either I, high I, priority, medium yeah. priority, no, I agree with what you're saying. I think uh, I'm stuck on the North Campus Corridor because we don't have the Star Bond yet and we don't have the build grants yet. So I'm kind of, when you say we're going to exceed the 90 million, we may need more than the 90 million. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I mean, the North Campus Corridor projects is really 13 projects. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in we're itself. We're only accounting <laughs> for 11 million, so that's what I'm thinking. You, you have to so, remember too that none of these have gone out to bid. Yeah. 
See, I was thinking the slide. You had the slide that said resolution number 060419-E. It's part of your PowerPoint. Yeah, that one there. You know, the way I read that, that's the priority, the levy, because we've already made a commitment on that. We're going to pay for that. The, the airport still may be up in the air in Aggieville, and then that North Campus quarter has got multiple phases. And then the joint maintenance facility, and the last thing should be the Douglas Center. So, you know, to me, that was the priority list. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things here. One, as Ron pointed out, we've got some of these in various states of planning already, and they depend on uh, that planning and, and uh, timeline in order to get done. So, for example, the levy is being planned, and because it's, it's a safety issue, that's a... That's a number one requirement. Aggieville is in train now. The runway is yet to be determined. We don't know uh, whether we're going to do minor or significant repairs and how long it's going to be closed. North Campus Corridor, we still have uh, some funding streams that have yet to be decided. We know in general terms how much each one of those 13 projects cost. Uh, and then joint maintenance facility we've got work to do there and we've got a project timeline already for the Douglas Center so um, and then the other thing I mean what if we, we have another levy project I mean there's always going to be a priority that's going to hop in here so um, I think as long as we let everybody know that we've got these projects right now that are on our radar I'm not quite sure uh, you can prioritize, but you have to also execute against the timeline. So, I think these are going to be implemented. I think they're going to come to fruition at some point. So I've put significant in addition to these projects. But I don't want to use examples of these projects. So I don't know where would you put in in addition to these projects. So that was kind of where, that was kind of where I was going with, with something like, and maybe Bill has better, better thoughts or Katie, but significant projects to be considered include but may not be limited to. Yeah, okay. That's, that's acceptable. The reason I said example was because I was trying to stress that the, the sales tax proceeds are going to be used for significant projects. It's hard to define what a significant project is. Here are some examples of significant projects. It also says that those listed ones have priority over anything else unless there's a specific finding that something else ought to take priority so I was trying to have it both ways I was trying to to allow the Commission the flexibility to determine what a significant project was using these examples but still indicate that for right now at least those projects have priority over anything else I didn't see that I guess I saw the text the resolution well I thought the I, resol resolution said that very statement this one right here it, yeah it does okay uh, I saw that right and that's where it said examples of right shall have priority other over other similar projects okay and it's very difficult to prioritize those projects in and of themselves for the very reasons you're talking about. You don't know when they're coming on or what might be more urgent than another. So again, it says that the governing body has the authority to determine what those priorities are when you have the facts in front of you. I would probably, I, I still am just summing up on the fact that we're focusing so much on projects. Maybe I, I almost feel better if it was maybe called priorities and I don't know to me priority number one is 
stop reduce it, stop increasing your mill every every year because of cola and step increases. That's priority number yeah. one, period. The rest of these things, I want every single one of them to happen, some more than others, and there's aspects of some I don't agree with it. But we have to evaluate those like we do every other project, one by one. And so again, I, I just worry that we pass this and Aggieville's included. To me as a voter, that means every single aspect of Aggieville that's been proposed thus far is going to happen, right? And I don't agree with every single aspect of the Aggieville pro project, and I don't know if I'm gonna vote to fund it. So I don't know, I just don't like necessarily how much we're focusing on projects and maybe I would like it uh, I would agree with it slightly more if there was more emphasis on <laughs> again just focusing on the fundamentals of our but our current budget problem aside from these projects the city administration when we discussed this wanted something we're, we're trying to make a general sales tax question look like a special sales tax question without legally doing that. So we have a general sales tax. This is a policy that says how we're going to spend it. And it's as specific as I can get. You're wanting more general and others are wanting more specific. So somehow you have to resolve that. Who's the majority? Yeah. I, I'll write it the way, or we will write it the way the commission wants it written. How about we just call the question and vote on this? Yeah, we can either do that or kind of get a consensus on whether we should consider item E separately. You, you can do whatever you want when you can make a yeah, motion. Yeah, I, I think that, you know if you consider it separately, it goose up the education process, and and I don't, you know it, it, whichever way we go, part of this is it's all going to be the education process. How we can communicate it because I, I agree with what you know uh, Commissioner McGee is saying you know that 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 employee cost is, is a big part of it and then you got the timelines I just don't know how you're going to be able to explain it in a resolution it's just too complicated and, and and so the idea for me I guess I always looked at priorities as being more you know general like our priorities are these but you know if a hole takes place and the levy is going to change everything or some other disaster can take place and so it's got to be vague Otherwise, you run the legal problem. So what I'd like to do is just, let's just vote on this motion. Okay. And I'll make the motion, approve resolution number 060419 Delta, authorizing and providing for the calling of a special question election in the city of Manhattan, Kansas, to increase the general purpose sales tax by 0.3%, and resolution number 060419-E, adopting the guidelines that will govern the process and procedures to expend that sales tax increase. Second. Gary, you can call the roll. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. And Commissioner McKee. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. All right. Being no further business, we'll no, stand. We, we do have executive <laughs> session. 10 15. So we need uh, 20 minutes? Yeah. All right, we'll uh, go into executive session and reconvene at uh, 20 minutes, a quarter after the hour. We need a motion. We need a motion to yeah. 10 15 specific. Can you tell I move, yeah, I move we go into executive. Is there an exact one that I need to read? Linda. We have to vote. I move that we recess into executive session until 10.15 p.m. for the purpose of discussing matters pursuant to KSA 75-4319-B3 that presently need to remain confidential and are related to employer-employee negotiations between the city administration oh, and local 2275 International Association of Firefighters, the union representing certain members of the Manhattan Fire Department. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Dodson? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Commissioner McKee? Yes. Commissioner Morse? Yes. Motion carries 5 0.